The entire city of Gotham is cut off from the rest of the world, leaving them in a no man's land. Today we're going to be giving you the full story of No Man's Land right here at Comic Story, and where I create audio dramas of your favorite comic books so that you know which ones you can enjoy and add into your collection. The story of Batman No Man's Land doesn't need that much context, but it does begin with the fall of Gotham. Gotham has been destroyed, and Batman has gone missing in the destruction. Due to this, the city of Gotham has been disconnected from the rest of the United States, and they're left to fend for themselves without Batman, but the rest of the Bat family is running around. This is the complete collection of the Batman No Man's Land storyline that we covered here like two years ago. I hope you guys enjoy, and let's get into it. Faint sounds of signs flapping in the wind can be heard along the Gotham City limits. These signs tell a person that if they continue, they would be leaving the United States, or that the area has been declared off limits by the federal authority. And that is because there was an earthquake, one that shook the very foundation that was Gotham City. Now soldiers gather around the perimeter of the city, turning those who wish to enter away. Even a priest who just wanted to provide aid to those in need is turned away, leaving him to find other ways. Even after bribing a helicopter pilot to fly close to the ruined city, the priest is forced to just throw his box of supplies out. As the food scatters down below in Gotham, the people gather, grabbing what they can, looking around to see if anyone else noticed. And of course, people do notice, and they would steal right from a person's hand just to have a bite. This regression has forced people to fight for what they want or keep, even if the methods are crude. A spiked tennis ball fired from a sling into one's back often does the trick, though. And those lucky enough to have numbers like the GCPD are able to maintain some order in this city, even if they too have to adjust to the times. With food being a rarity all on its own, the crime lords have started to make strongholds around the city, killing anyone who even thought of stealing from them. But for those fortunate enough to not have their findings stolen, they were given a chance to barter for other goods. Hell, things like an apple can catch the eyes of those willing to pay big enough just for a chance to bite into something fresh. Auctions are held for those privileged few by the penguin himself. People offer five gallons of gasoline, some offer ten. One man even offered a night with his girl. But another man offers a twenty-carat diamond, which penguin accepts. Even in these times, penguin still kept his refined tastes in jewelry. It's been just over three months in no man's land, and one person keeping record of that is Barbara Gordon. She watches from her tower, barricaded in with plenty of food, medicine, and rechargeable solar batteries. She had the chance to leave, but there was this nagging sense of duty to stay, something she must have gotten from her father. So to get by, Barbara deals in information, with maps, knowledge of various underground supplies, stashes, and fallout shelters she does well for herself. She even tricks the locals to get her food from these caches by telling them that they are poisoned and only she has a means to neutralize it. Little do these people know, the food isn't poisoned, but if they knew that, well they might not come back. With her network of information, Barbara has also learned that Jeremiah Arkham decided to let all of the criminals and his asylum back into the streets before he left town. The neighborhoods were sectioned off and tagged to show who owns what. All the big players are there. Two-Face, Killer Croc, Black Mask, the Ventriloquist and Scarface, the Joker, though his whereabouts are currently unknown. The only person who didn't go insane was Penguin. Rumor has it that he's got a pipeline for stuff from the outside. Obviously, in a world where a box of matches is more valuable than a camera, a bike is more useful than a Ferrari, an entrepreneur like Penguin is going to thrive. But the people, why do they stay in Gotham? Some had no choice, some saw it as a great adventure, others saw a unique opportunity, and some believed their own reality welcoming the mothership to land. With food and resources now currently being the only currency, people protect and defend their own tooth and nail. People with trade skills like mechanics or seamstresses are brought into the folds and offered protection. People with social skills, they're normally turned away since they don't have anything that they can really offer. And what of Gotham's leading citizen, Bruce Wayne? Where did he go? After being humiliated and insulted before Congress, he disappeared. Ironically, all of his properties were quake-proof except his personal home. Did he give up? 
Did he leave Gotham? Well, no one knows for sure. But without the presence of Batman, the GCPD have taken it upon themselves to dish out their own brand of justice. Since there are no jails, the GCPD steps in for those in need, literally taking the clothing off of the backs who try to take what isn't theirs. However, one day, using what little they had, one of the officers made a makeshift bat signal, stating that he was hoping this could give people hope. Jim quickly destroyed the signal though, shouting, No! We don't need this because he's not coming! He gave up on Gotham like everyone else. He always took the easy way out. Being a vigilante was much easier than being an actual cop, though some say. In certain parts of the city, they can see a tag, one shaped like a bat. Some even go as far as to state that they have seen Batman, but all they could see were shadows. Word travels to Barbara, however, that something is off. Batman wouldn't use the tag to show himself. It just isn't his style, or would he? In no man's land, there's no status quo, but still, if it is him, why wasn't he calling her? One night as the cold sets in, a pair of drifters get cornered by a group of thugs, noticing that they have nice warm coats. The drifters try to run, but the thugs begin to catch up, with the drifters bracing themselves for a beating. But that beating, it doesn't come. When the drifters open up their eyes, they see the bat-shaped shadow fighting against the thugs. One of the thugs begins to beg Batman not to kill him, but the voice that responds is female. Wearing a cowl covering her whole face, she tells the thugs that this area is under her protection. Another thug grabs the brick stating that it's just a girl, and the woman tells him that she is the bat, their worst nightmare. The Batgirl effortlessly disarms and beats the thugs down until they decide that enough is enough and they run away. Once they're gone, that Batgirl tags the wall with her mark and one of the drifters asks, does she like work with Batman? She asks, how do you know that she isn't Batman? If you were a big tough guy and got beat up by a girl, would you admit it? Or would you state that it was some huge seven foot tall giant with fangs and claws? The Drifter says that that's a fair point. Back with the GCPD, Jim looks to expand his territory and protect those in need. And what better way to do that than to start a gang war between two gang factions? As the night comes, Jim and Bach both head out looking for a demon's tag when they come across a group of people trying to keep warm around a pile of burning books. Jim sighs to himself, stating that once they take back the city, he's gonna make it a punishable offense to burn books. But soon they come across what they're looking for a demon's tag. Bach begins to cross out the tag and replace it with the low boys tag when someone calls out to him. Jim spins around, shining his light on a group of demons, and he tells them, Look, you don't look like low boys, but really, we don't care. The penalty for trashing the demons is death. As the demons thugs move in, there's three gunshots, and a masked man says that he really hopes they don't mind. The man pulls off his mask, revealing himself to be another officer, Petite, and Jim asks, You've been following us all night? Petit tells him that he couldn't sleep knowing that they might turn up dead trying to turn the gangs against one another. Was he wrong? Jim doesn't respond and Petit sits the dead demons along the low boy's tag stating, Now this will incite a war. Petit takes a deep breath and shouts, Oh demons, come out and play! Petit's call echoes throughout the abandoned buildings, reaching the ears of the demons nearby. They run over to where the sound came from and they find three of their brothers dead under a low boy's tag. As they decide to report back, Petit leans around the corner yelling, Chick, chick, chick! The demons quickly rush to the sound, and Jim and the others lead the group right to a group of low boys. After quickly ducking away into an alley, the demons begin to yell at the low boys that they're going to die. But up from a nearby building, Petit watches, stating, Congratulations, you guys just started a gang war. A few nights later, a group of thugs sit by a broken bridge when they notice an old man wandering around. The thugs jump out to mug the man, but they decide that they have a better idea. They're just going to test to see if the water separating them from the other side really do have mines. So they push that man towards the ledge, stating that if there are mines, they will just have to keep throwing people in until there's none left. As the old man is pushed over the edge, the thugs hear something. They look up, and they see the Batman. Batman quickly disarms one of the thugs, and the other pulls out a knife with Batman throwing him to the ground. He tells Alfred, the old man, to hang on. And as Alfred dangles on a rhubarb sticking out of the concrete, he says, Yes, a sensible course of action, sir. Batman bashes one of the men with a broken car door and throws a rock at another. 
He then ducks to avoid the rock as it hits one of the thugs by the ledge, sending him over. He screams as he falls in, and when he hits the water, there's a loud BOOM as the mine goes off. Batman helps Alfred up, apologizing. I'm sorry I didn't get here any sooner. I need to relearn how to get around. All the broken cornices and rubble and collapsed rooftops are slowing me down. Alfred then says, It's been a while since you've been in action. How does it feel? Did it feel good? Batman tells him, No, it didn't feel good. It felt great. Though Batman is working solo, he does at least make an effort to inform Barbara that he is back, even if he doesn't answer any of her questions. The next day, Jim's war between the demons and the low boys rage on, with Jim bringing in his men to tell them that this is now GCPD territory. They can surrender now, or they can have them thrown out there. With the two gangs already disorganized from their fighting, it doesn't take long for Jim and the GCPD to clean up and take control. It could be said that Jim didn't just do this to expand their territory, but also to take over the area where Barbara was. Once the remaining demons and low boys are rounded up, Jim tells them again that this area is now GCPD territory. They have one hour to clear out, and if any of the demons or low boys are found here, the penalty will be death. Petit then says to just show them that we're not fooling around. He puts one of his guns to the demons and pulls a trigger. The demons slumps to the ground as everyone scatters and Jim shouts, That was way out of line! We are still police and that means that we will not resort to death squad tactics. Is that understood? Petit says that he was just taking a little more initiative is all. Now they know the GCPD is prepared to enforce their death penalty. They will run all over town telling everyone that the cops have gone crazy. Maybe this time they won't actually come back. If he thinks he was wrong, look him in the eye and tell him. Jim stares into Petit's eyes, and he says nothing. So Petit walks off telling them, All right, enjoy those sticks. Meanwhile, over at Dooley Square, Batgirl finishes taking out a thug when someone tells her, You have a nice costume. She spins around to see Batman and says, She didn't think that he would approve. He hasn't been around and Gotham needed a bat. Batman tells her, My whereabouts and my reasons are my own, but I don't do partners. They've already been sent away because of how dangerous this place is going to be. Batgirl says, well, she plans on continuing to do what she can with or without the costume. She could take it off if he asks. Batman doesn't say anything at first. And then he looks at the bat tag and he says, that's a good idea. I plan on using it. Batgirl then asks, do you mean that I'm approved? And Batman says, you're not disapproved for now. The next day, Jim and his men stumble upon a bat tag. And Jim's scout, Ramirez, asks what does it mean. Jim yells that he'll tell them what it means. Nothing! If he really was here, wouldn't he announce himself? Just paint over it. It's not him. It's not his style. But later that night, Batman returns to the area to find that his tag was painted over. And he thinks to himself that he's been gone way too long. There's no respect, no fear. And why should he be surprised? Myths lose their power if they aren't repeated. If they don't see him, they won't talk about him. So Batman sneaks into a Scarface-controlled building, and as the person inside wakes up, Batman says, I'm on your side. Just tell me where Scarface sleeps. The man begins to shout, No! Scarface protects us! You're bad! Get out! Just then, one of Scarface's enforcers kicks in the door, firing a shot, barely missing the Batman. He jumps out the window, running, and as the enforcer looks out the window, he doesn't take a second shot. Batman returns to his hideout to try and figure out a way to get close to Scarface. He can't use his high-end tech because it's useless out there. So right now he's going to have to rely on his own brain. Ventriloquist and Scarface have something that the others need, but they aren't taking it from them. Why? Or maybe they can't. That's right. They control the bullets. That's why the Enforcer didn't take a second shot. It's because he couldn't. This costume right now is a liability. It's time to compromise. He's gonna take it off until the time is right. The next morning, Batman heads out without the mask into Scarface's territory. And a man points a gun at him asking, what is he doing? Batman tells him that he's looking to trade. He wouldn't waste his one bullet on a man who could just drop the soda, right? The enforcer then asks, how did he know you only had one bullet? Batman tells him, I knew a guy who ran with the ventriloquist of Scarface a while back. He was the cheapest boss around, always grinding him on the split. He's grinding you too, isn't he? The enforcer last stated that he can't complain, but hey, he's got some cigarettes trade for the soda. But before the trade could happen, the enforcer notices a few people not working and yells at them to get back to work. Batman asks what's the deal with them, and the enforcer explains that they offer to protect the people here, and they work for them finding stuff. Scarface gets first pick, Rhino divvies up the rest. The suckers get nothing fancy, but enough to live on, like dog food. Batman then asks, how do you protect everyone if you only have one bullet? Then the Enforcer tells him that Scarface said they needed to conserve their resources, only eight of them around. 
Batman thinks to himself, Okay, one boss, one lieutenant, eight rifles. Now I know the score. He tells the enforcer that he'll trade him the soda for a lighter on one condition. Give this message to Scarface, and there might be another bottle of soda in it for him. Later, Scarface reads Batman's letter aloud, stating, I have 1,000 rounds of 9mm ammunition for trade. If you're interested, send someone wearing a red armband to the same place. Scarface then looks at the enforcer and asks, Who gave you this? And the enforcer says, Some guy he's never seen before. He knew what he was talking about, though. Wasn't like their usual dummies or fools. Ventriloquist says that they should discipline their men. They know that they should be talking to strangers. They can't trust a message like that. Scarface then crumbles up the letter, stating, But we can't ignore it. Our ammo isn't going to last forever. So the next day, Batman goes in to discuss the trade, with Scarface offering that he can take whatever he can carry with two arms. Batman tells him okay, but they can't do the trade in their territory. It's just asking to get shot. If he does want to trade, bring two dozen flashlights and batteries to Addison Street some way. The case of ammo will be there. Leave the lights, take the ammo, simple as that. Scarface then asks, How do I know you ain't gonna double cross us? Batman tells him, If you're worried, then don't show up. I can always deal with Black Masks gang. So Scarface tells him, Fine, noon tomorrow. Addison Subway. The next day, Scarface and his men find the crate that Batman left, and when they open it, there's a blinding flash of white light. Batman runs in, knocking the enforcers out, and tells Alfred to tie them up. He then looks at the ventriloquist, yelling to say his name. SAY MY NAME! And then he snatches Scarface. Ventriloquist tells him, BATMAN! And Batman yells, LOUDER! So the ventriloquist shouts, BATMAN! And Batman then says, who's in charge here? And the ventriloquist shouts, Batman, Batman's in charge. As everyone is tied up, Batman takes to the streets calling to everyone. Scarface is finished. This is now the territory of Batman. To everyone with a rifle, your friends aren't coming back. Surrender or face my wrath. A man takes a shot at Batman, hitting him in the back, and he falls to the ground. But after a few moments, Batman gets back up, and he starts to walk. More shots begin to hit him again, and he gets up the second time, with the shooters yelling that he can't be killed. He ain't human. Batman laughs to himself, thinking, thankfully, they didn't have armor-piercing shells. Now it's time to really take control. Scarface's enforcers leave the area, but as Batman tells everyone that they are free, one of the men asks who will feed them now. Batman throws the Scarface doll down, stating that they will feed themselves. And another man says that's not how it works. They have to give him tribute, and he gives them what they need. Rhino took good care of them, making sure that no one got any more than any other. Batman thinks to himself, I know who these people are. The destitute, former welfare recipients. The unmotivated. Rhino then says, it's not about the good guys or bad guys, it's about survival at this point. So Batman tries to think of something, and he says, Okay. Whatever you were doing this morning, keep doing it. He returns to the subway telling the enforcers, You have a choice. You can either work for Batman or you can go with him. One of the men asks, where is the ventriloquist going? And Batman tells him, Hell! The ventriloquist begins to speak, asking, but... And just then, Batman smacks him, yelling, Shut up! Who's in charge? He hands his knife to Alfred, telling him, Free them. And then he tells the enforcers that if they want to try and take him down, now's their chance. He heads back inside, gathering everyone together, stating, you all work for me now. Everything will be just like it was before. Rhino will provide the rations, real food, not dog food. You will get first choice of goods and supplies. You'll get first choice of food and drink. You're never gonna know when I show up. So don't mess up or I'll take you out. As everyone begins to get back to work, Alfred asks, Tribute? What are we now, pirates? And Batman tells him, no, it's a sign of respect. It's the language of one that cannot succeed unless one is fluent in it. Alfred then asks, Aren't you fluent enough? So Batman replaces the Scarface tag with one of his own, stating, Not yet, but I intend to be. For a brief moment, the world is calm, silent. As lightning strikes, it makes the sound as if the universe itself was split into two. As Azrael checks his costume, he's struck from behind by a pair of fists. A man shouts that he is one of them, and Azrael yells, No, I'm the guy who dragged your sorry tales out of the fire. As for my clothing, don't you recognize the new Red Cross uniform? Get a clue. But as Azrael walks off, he thinks to himself that one more punch and he would have been out. The old Azrael would have handled the three of them within seconds. The new version? Let's just hope that there isn't a pack of angry Cub Scouts up ahead. The costume he wore before he made Azrael. But now it went up in smoke along with Lad's home. 
The new suit is, well, he's just regular old Jean-Paul Valley dressed for Halloween. However, there are more pressing matters to focus on. Lad has information about Nick Scratch, and now that Lad is gone, Azrael follows the tracks to an old church nearby, and he notices muddy footprints walking throughout the halls. The footprints lead to a dusty organ, and they just stop. Azrael looks around the seams of the organ, and he begins to pull on it, revealing a hidden pathway behind. As he shines his light, a man lunges forward to the pipe, knocking the flashlight out of his hand. He shouts that he won't get him, but Azrael tells him that he does not plan to harm the man he spoke with earlier about Scratch. His name is Azrael. After calming Lad down, he explains that yes, he does know something. Nick Scratch had an uncle who owned a fishing lodge at Dixon Lake near Bloodhaven. It is possible that Nick himself went there to hide out. Not many people know of the lodge's existence. With that newfound knowledge, Azrael sets out for Dixon Lake. And just like before, the storm is fierce. But even as the rain hits his face with the force of a slap, he presses on. Just then the lightning strikes with a sound that can shatter the night. Azrael pauses, seeing the lightning strike right next to him. And he thinks to himself that after just a few more yards, he would have been nothing more than a pile of ash. He should return and wait for the storm to die out, but he won't. Besides, what are the chances of that happening again? One in a million? As long as he can get to the car. A second bolt strikes, but this time under Azrael's feet. He jumps out of the way, the ringing in his ear, causing him to lose hearing for a moment. But after a few seconds, sound gradually returns. And with it, the sound of rain, wind, and voices. Three men walk up, all branding pitchforks, stating that they know who he is. Scratch must want them to kill him. Azrael stands up asking, why? Why do you follow Scratch? And the men tell their stories. One pumped gas, which was boring. The second was an accountant, which was banal. The third was a lawyer, which was both boring and banal. Scratch gave them purpose, guidance, made them special. Azrael listens, knowing that Scratch has relieved them of their actions and thoughts, ultimately taking away their humanity. He was like them once. The world was a simpler place. Azrael readies himself for a fight, getting ready to draw his blades, but he realizes that this is not the right costume. He doesn't have blades. He prepares himself for the worst when suddenly lightning strikes again, except this time it hits Azrael. He falls to the ground, his body smoldering, and the three men ask, did Nick Scratch do that? He must have. How else could it have happened? Either way, their job is done. But before the men leave, Azrael drags his fingers through the dirt as he pulls himself up, telling them, no, it isn't. Later, Azrael will question why he isn't dead. Was it a natural phenomenon? A miracle? Whatever the case, something inside him changed. His movements, his accuracy, his form, all of it worked together to fight these men. Mind and body, quick and fluid and certain. As Azrael kicks and knocks out the last devil, he allows himself to smile, and with that, the storm passes. The earth is quiet again. Azrael travels the land, passing Bloodhaven and arriving at Dixon Lake. When he gets out of the lodge, he notices the tracks in the ground are still fresh. Did someone come or did they go? Is someone inside aiming a gun at him? Is he going to step on a mine secretly planted in the ground? He asks himself these questions, but still pushes through, kicking the door to the lodge in. There's no sign of scratch, but there is a note. Azriel, I thought you might get this far. Sorry I missed you. Gone to Gotham City. See you there. Your pal, Nick. Skip ahead 11 days because it's been 11 days since she was trapped there. The water is nearly gone. The nights are freezing. Three days since she's last eaten. Welcome to Gotham City. As curiosity sets in, the young woman looks down a dark hall, asking if he's down there. Can he hear her? What does he want? And from the shadows, a large man sits on a pile of bones, stating that he thought that she already knew. He wants her. Meanwhile, just outside of the city, Nick Scratch tells the guards that he must get over the river. Those poor, deeply troubled souls over there, they need salvation. They need a message that only he can bring them. The guards are hesitant at first, claiming that they have their orders to not let anyone over. But the more that Nick speaks, the more the guards accept. While Nick convinces the guards to grant him passage on the other side of the dock, as Riel watches. He can't hear what they're saying, but he knows that they're planning to ferry Nick across. But before Azrael could act, the older woman by the name of Miss Friedang appears, stating that he has a funny costume. But if he could, she must get over to Gotham. Her daughter is trapped over there, but before she lost contact, her daughter said that she was in terrible danger. She's sorry to ask a thing, but... Azrael reluctantly agrees to help, but now instead of just getting himself over, he must find a way to get Mrs. Friedang over. He lights a torch, throwing it into an old truck, and he pushes the flaming truck into the docks. 
As the guards begin to put the fire out, Azriel takes Mrs. Friedang and jumps onto the boat that was prepared for Nick. As the boat gets ready to sail back across the river, the woman looks back down into the pit, stating that she doesn't see anything. It's so dark. The woman's boyfriend says that he's probably gone. They were up there freezing their butts off, scared by some boogeyman who isn't there. He's going to go down there and search for food. Anything will be better than sitting here listening to her whining. The dumbest thing that he ever did was hook up with a loser like her. As the boyfriend lowers himself down, the woman pulls the rope ladder back up, stating that when he comes back, she'll help him get back up. The boyfriend scoffs, asking, come back to you? You're so dumb, you probably believe that I would. Just then a pair of gleaming eyes appears in the darkness and the large man from before steps out with a knife, asking the boyfriend if he would like to join him for dinner. The boyfriend stumbles back, stating, wait, wait, you want the girl, right? I can get you the girl, no problem, just let me. The large man holds the knife, telling him, her time will come. And then a short, ear-piercing scream can be heard as it echoes throughout the city. Over at the Gotham City docks, Nick's boat is secured, and as Nick walks out, he says that he would like to thank them for bringing him over. But before he could leave, a group of thugs walk out wielding pipes and chains, asking what do they have there on the boat. One of the guards grabs his gun, firing at the thugs, but when his shot misses, the thug with the chain swings it, knocking the gun from the guard's hands. Just then, Azriel jumps from the boat, telling everyone to leave. And one of the thugs lunges at Azriel, but just like before, Azriel dispatches him with ease. A kick here, a throw there. The thugs prove to be easy sparring partners. But during the fight, Nick takes his chance to escape into the night. Once everything is over, Mrs. Friedang steps off the boat asking if it's safe now, and Azriel tells her, yes, let us go find your daughter. However, just across the street, the large man found the woman as she screams for help. Mrs. Friedang says that that's her. That's my daughter, Mitzi. Azriel quickly leaps onto a nearby car and onto the roof of a broken building, separating the man and Mitzi. The man rushes in and Azriel consents that this man's strength is equal to three men and he himself is already exhausted. The man grabs Azriel by the cape and slams him down and just as Azriel gets back up, he swipes at the man's face, cutting it. The two exchange blows back and forth, but using his large figure against him, Azriel kicks the man back and off the ledge of the building. The man falls several stories down into the street, and when it all seems clear, there's a gunshot. Mrs. Friedang points her gun at Mitzi, stating that she ran away with that animal. She disgraced their family and caused her poor father to have a heart attack. Mitzi looked where the bullet hit and says that she missed. Mrs. Friedang lowers the gun, stating that she knows. She just had to get it out of her system, now give her a hug. Azriel watches as mother and daughter reunite and thinks to himself, another happy ending, another night in no man's land. And Azriel has joined the fray. As the roaring fire cackles over the voices of those throwing books into the pit, one man from afar watches in the shadows. Barbarian thinks to himself, he's never known a cold so bitter that it must be staved off with books. Scarecrow quietly watches as more books are collected and then notices one of them put aside. What book could be so important that they could not burn it? Ah. Of course, the Bible. It is time to enact the plan. The next morning, outside of the broken down church, Jonah tells Father Chris that he's almost done setting up the sign. However, they're going to need a tag, something to show the people of this block that it is protected. Father Chris has taken it upon himself to shelter those in need and provide safe haven from the evil that wanders the streets of Gotham. But as much as Chris refuses to fall under the protection of any one gang, there's one person trying her best to look out for them, the Huntress. There's also a third group who stay in the areas, and there's a splinter cell group of black masks, false facers, led by a man named Leo, who's trying to make it out on his own. Leo leads his men into one of the old precincts, telling them that there's a stash of ammo here that they could use. But as his men get inside, they state that this place is already cleaned out. Everything was taken, down to the ballpoint pens. Leo laughs, walking into the morgue, telling them that this is it. Welcome to Ammo Central. He pulls out one of the decomposing bodies, pulling out the bullets used to kill them, stating that they just have to reforge these and score some gunpowder. However, as Leo digs through one of the bodies, Mikey says that he's not so sure about this. This ain't right. As Mikey stumbles out of the room, he falls through a glass door before a pair of boots. He gets up asking, who? And just as if he's answering, Batman punches him in the face. Batman slams his head into the ground asking, why are you here? And Mikey tells him because they're grave robbing for bullets. He didn't want to, but things are just so bad out there. There's got to be some way to set things right. There's got to be hope for someone like him, right? Right? 
So Batman brings him to the one place that would accept a black mask outcast, Father Chris. Huntress makes her rounds for the night and sees Mikey sitting off to the side and asks herself, isn't that? But Batman appears behind her. Yes, a former black masker. Mikey is to not be touched, not yet. Huntress goes in to check how things are and just as she begins to speak with Father Chris, she notices one other person that has been accepted. Scarecrow. Without another word, she runs over, knocking Scarecrow to the ground, shouting that she doesn't know what he's up to, but she will not allow this. Father Chris hurries over to break the fight, stating that she must control herself. He understands that this man once did bad things. Huntress yells, he killed people! And Father Chris says that this is a place of sanctuary. Gotham is no longer black and white, if indeed it ever was. Huntress then says that that monster is a threat to everything that they're doing here. She confesses that her own morality has at times been questionable, but she knows the difference between the good guys and the bad guys. As Scarecrow picks himself up, he asks, Are you really sure about that? However, Huntress isn't wrong. There are things that Scarecrow is planning, but what? remains unseen. After collecting a dozen of rabies-infected rats, Scarecrow releases them into the church's food storage. When Father Chris finds them, Scarecrow says that it's just terrible. Who could have done this? This sort of crisis would surely lead to the worst kind of human ugliness out there. All these people are depending on you. But there is somewhere that you could go to get more supplies. No, no. A man in your position must always put morality before even survival. Father Chris asks him what does he mean? Does he know of a place where they can get food to survive Gotham being separated with no supplies coming into the city? They're running low. Later that night, Penguin looks out the window watching the GCPD mark their territory. And he says that he understands that they need food while he provides a safe place for his arsenal. Rifles, guns, gunpowder, etc. This really is the greatest supply of weaponry that Gotham has to offer. He has two advantages to make him the perfect concealer. In addition to having an unused fallout shelter underneath the cathedral, Batman trusts him and would never think to search the territory. Father Chris prays out loud trying to find the strength to walk away, but Penguin tells him that he understands his predicament and he will make it easier for him. The church does not have a choice in this. Either he takes the weapons willingly, hiding them in the basement away from Batman's prying eyes, or he will simply shoot him and hide them there anyway. Consider the food and medicine a gift of charity. Meanwhile, in another part of town, Leo brings his men to a building said to have housed all of Penguin's surplus goods. But as the men begin to search the dilapidated buildings, one of the men gets punched through a wall. Leo asks what the hell was that, and the man says that this place must be haunted. The exit slams shut, and Batman tells them, not haunted, infested. All the men begin to run towards the exit, trying to pry the door open, but just then an arrow shoots up from underneath the ground, and it's pulled back down. The second the floor gives way, everyone crashes into the basement, with Batgirl stating, yeah, this place is infested by bats. But just as she finishes, explosions go off and Batgirl throws a battering out of the window to allow the facers to escape. Once the last of them pushes out, Batgirl fires her grappling hoop into the ceiling where Batman can grab it and pull her up. Batgirl sighs, stating that she's sorry that she let them go. But at least they didn't get any of Penguin's ammo. Batman tells her that there wasn't any ammo for them to get. It was arson and no one would be insane enough to burn supplies. Batgirl then asks what about the false facer at the Ark Refugee Center. She heard that he brought him there. Is that safe? Batman tells her. So long as my former friends stay away from him, yes, I'd like to think so. But at this time, Scarecrow is convincing Mikey to do the exact opposite. He tells Mikey that Father Chris has received those weapons. They're going to need protection. Protection from, say, your old splinter group. Mikey then asks, why would Father Chris not ask him himself? As Scarecrow tells him, because the father is a proud man. It's just, he didn't want the protection of the GCPD. It would make people here too nervous that things might be run like a police state. Father Chris never intended us to be defenseless. He was just too nervous to ask. As Mikey grabs the supplies and he runs over to Leo's hideout, he tells him that he's got that gunpowder that they were looking for. That's not all. The refugee center wants to hire them as protectors. Wait, is something wrong? Leo reaches down into the crate, pulling out a gun, pulls back the hammer, and he fires. Huntress hears the gunshot echo throughout the streets and rushes to where the sound came from. It's there that she finds Mikey on the ground, holding his stomach, begging for help, next to a note that says, Traitor. While Huntress tries to make sense of all of this, Scarecrow watches from the shadows. Huntress rushes back to Batman, who's been sitting there with his arms folded, telling him that Mikey's been shot. Batman says that there's somewhere that she can take him. 
But Hunter stops him, yelling, she can't leave now. What does he want to hear? That she can't do this without his help? That she's not strong enough, fast enough? She's tired of begging. She isn't here to ask for a scrap. She's asking him to save someone. She has come a long way for him, and she has worked hard to be worthy. Maybe harder than he knows, but right now she's going to need him to trust her to watch over this place. Batman takes Huntress's hand off his cape, telling her, bring him back out. While Batman takes Mikey to Leslie Tompkins' makeshift hospital, back at the church, Scarecrow tells everyone that Mikey is dead. Surely you all know in your hearts by now. What makes you think that your lives won't end the same way? But while he goes around spreading concern, Huntress tells Father Chris that it is naive to let him stay. Father Chris tells her that she's naive to think that he'd turn away someone in need of help. Besides, without his fear-inducing chemicals, Scarecrow is just a man. He's no more dangerous than anyone else in this town. Hunter says that she prays that he will never learn how wrong he is about that. And over in the hospital, Leslie comes out of the operating room with Batman asking, how is he? She pulls off her gloves, stating critical, but he at least has a chance now. And how have you been? I haven't seen you since, well, the fall of Gotham. Batman doesn't directly respond, but he says that he needs to get back out there. He needs to find out who shot Mikey. Leslie pulls Batman's mask off. Bruce, and Batman says, why did you stay? She sits down, stating that she asked his father 30 years ago the same question. Thomas just looked at her with those sad, serious eyes and said, there's still work to be done. Dr. Wayne had no intentions of packing up his bags and leaving. She loved his father and a part of her stayed with him, but what about him? What made you stay, Bruce? Batman pauses for a moment, and as he leaves, he says, part of me stayed just for you. Later at the Penguin's chambers, Penguin sips his tea, stating, kill him. Batman tells him, the boy almost died tonight because of the guns you put on the street before he passed out. He said that there were more elsewhere. Where are they, Penguin? Penguin asks, what are you going to do, arrest me? If that's what you think, you're mistaken. As Penguin's men get ready to attack, Batman sprays his spray paint can to blind the guards before knocking them out. He then reaches into his belt, pulling out a small device, and he sets it up, stating, this miniature electromagnetic pulse will destroy all of the generators that you've been hoarding, permanently. He sets the timer for 15 seconds, with Penguin shouting, there are no guns! Batman starts to count, six, five, four. Penguin shouts, curse you! They're inside the refugee center! Batman grits his teeth. You psychopath! And he jumps out the window, leaving the device behind. Penguin rushes over, asking, How do I turn this? But as he looks at it, he realizes the device is just a clock. He smashes it, yelling to his guards that he wants those guns back. Back at the church, Scarecrow comes up with a plan, but for it to work, he's going to need to pull a few strings. And the first step of that is leaving a letter to the Huntress. Later inside of the Gotham Museum, Leona's crew scavenge through the building looking for supplies when Scarecrow appears before them. He tells them that if they want more guns, the people of the church aren't going to stop you if you tried taking them. But back over at the church, a small child brings Huntress the letter. She reads it shouting, what the hell is going on here? She heads down into the fallout shelter and when she returns, she dumps the box of guns that Penguin gave to Father Chris. A short while later, Scarecrow returns asking, well, well, what do we have here? Father Chris yells, I had no choice. You must believe me. But just then, Huntress tells everyone to get down. They have trouble. Outside, Leo and his men position themselves, and Leo calls out that all they want is the rest of the weapons. Let them inside and no one will get hurt. Huntress yells back that they have no intentions of giving them anything. If they set one foot inside of her, she swears that they won't come out alive. Father Chris runs out shouting, wait, don't provoke them. And Hunter spins back, telling him, You don't get to call the shots anymore, Father. Just then, as she says that, Scarecrow yells, Oh, God! They'll kill us all if we don't do anything! What do we do? Oh, wait! We have the same weapons as the bad men outside! Find the courage to use them! We must defend ourselves! Hunter tries to calm the unruly crowd, but Father Chris takes down the barricade, stating that he started this, and he will be the one to end this. As Father Chris walks outside, the refugees grab whatever guns they can, and they point it out the window while the Scarecrow sits back smiling. A gun goes off, and as Father Chris checks himself, he notices that he's not bleeding. Everyone starts to look around, and one of Leo's men groans as he slides down the side of a car that they were positioned on. Just as the sound of more guns being fired can be heard, and Leo and his men are gunned down. Around the corner, a group of well-dressed men step out, stating, We represent the Penguin, and he wants his guns back. Huntress tries to get everyone back inside, but one of Penguin's men then grabs Father Chris, stating, If you don't do what we say, the priest is dead. Scarecrow tells everyone, No! You must fight back! Don't just sit there, attack! Once everyone gets inside, the refugees state that they need to do something. 
Look, just give me five minutes. If I can't save Father Chris and defuse the situation, do whatever you have to to survive. As Penguin's men wait for an answer, the one holding Father Chris has a needle thrown into his handle. Before he has a chance to shoot, Hunters jumps down and starts to take out the others. However, also watching from afar is Jim Gordon and the rest of the GCPD. The man that was holding Father Chris grabs him again, stating that if they don't think they don't kill the priest, they got another thing coming. But then there's another shot and the Scarecrow yells, That's it! That's it! Hunters yells for them to start firing, but the shooting didn't come from the church. Back at the car. Leo starts to unload his clip, asking if they want to shoot him in the back. Everyone starts to scatter for cover, but as Leo begins to unload, a shadow looms over him and he says, Oh, hell. After a few moments of silence, Leo steps out of the shadows, stating, Look, how about this? My three guns for the priest. One of Penguin's men that asks if this guy is for real. Why would they trade when they can just shoot him? Another then says, Allow me to answer that. And he leans over, shooting Leo. When they all turn back, they see Father Chris is not there. And Huntress helps Father Chris back into the church, with Scarecrow yelling, It's a sign! We have our shepherd back! Now is the time to strike! Just then, there's a creak and everyone turns back asking who's there. Leo yells, Whoa, 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 whoa! Settle down! I'm not armed! He said there was shelter here! Huntress stops him. Wait, if he's here, then who's out there? Penguins met head down to Leo's body, and they pull back his shirt to see the bat symbol. Batman springs up taking the men out and Jim gives the order for the men to move in. As Jim looks over the ledge, he sees Batman knocking out the last of Penguin's men stating, you can take this message back to the Penguin. Tell him that this block is off limits, permanently. He throws a smoke bomb covering the entire area and Petit asks, should they go after him? Jim tells him no. For better or for worse, the refugees have someone watching over them and though he doesn't fully trust their savior anymore, he can trust the integrity of their leader. Back inside of the church, Leo says that it was all Scarecrow's fault. He was the one who told him and his men to show up. Scarecrow tries to deny it, stating that this is the man that killed Mikey. But the refugees grab Scarecrow and they bring him down. The father tells Huntress that they need to stop the mob. They're going to kill him. And Huntress says that there's nothing that she could do even if she wanted. Revenge is human nature. Father says that it's also human nature to bend the force of a superior will. Please, he knows that she can help. I believe in you. Huntress takes a deep breath, stepping between everyone shouting, and she says, Enough! This is what he wants. If you kill him, you'll make him a martyr. Mikey isn't dead, but he's recovering. There's a great power in fear. It can be used to fuel hatred and viciousness. Yes, but it can also remind you of how much you're loved. Look at the Scarecrow. He's a small man who's afraid. Let us thank him for reminding us how much we still have to lose. All the refugees begin to thank Scarecrow, and they tell him that he'll be forgiven in the eyes of God. Once things settle down, Father Chris tells everyone that he will do the thing that he should have done in the first place. They throw the weapons into the ocean so that the weapons may never kill anyone. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Batgirl asks if she can take this thing off. After a few moments of silence, she says that she will take that as consent. As she takes off the blindfold, she looks around and asks where are they? The cave? Wait, this is a basement. This isn't your main headquarters, is it? Batman tells her, no, it's a cave. And Batgirl asks, what, you got more than one? Batman tells her, these days, you have to be flexible. The basement that they're standing in is the basement of the still standing Arkham Asylum. As Batman continues his crusade to rebuild his name, he sees a group of red devils crossing out one of his tags. He jumps down on the thugs, thinking that he was away too long. These people have fallen so far. These people have forgotten respect. One of the thugs swings a large wooden stick with Batman grabbing it and bashing the thug into the wall. Another shoots his crossbow, but Batman takes the stick and uses it to catch the bolt and then jumps up, spinning around on the stick to kick the other two. As the men groan from being beaten, Batman picks up one by the hair and holds out a spray can stating that he can put it back. The thug sprays over their tag to put Batman's back up, and once it's down, Batman throws him, telling him, leave. As another night passes in Gotham, another auction is held. Arrowheads for candy, blankets for bike tires, dog pelts for salt, pigeons for toothpaste. And of course, it's all overseen by Gotham's best entrepreneur, Penguin. He has wrought profit from the lawlessness, commerce from chaos, all for a mere 10% of the gross profits. As a couple presents their batteries for trade, Leonard, one of Penguin's enforcers, checks them to see that they don't have a charge. Leonard asks, what are you trying to pull here? We got laws here, and when you break our laws, you gotta pay. 
But before a letter could pull the trigger, Penguin stops him, telling him that he needs to work on his interpersonal skills. The woman says that she's so sorry, they're just so hungry. They would do anything for food. Penguin grabs the woman by the face and inspects her. Well, I'm certain we could find something for you to do. The man yells, get your filthy hands off her. And Leonard pushes his gun into his face with the penguin stating, you tried to cheat me. Lucky for you though, I have a soft spot for lovebirds. If love conquers all, then you'll both want for nothing. If not, well, that's another story. Take them away. But while all of this goes on, one of Barbara's informants reports Wynn stating that it's on. A short while later, Batman makes contact with Barbara stating that he needs to know of any place that is having mass meetings. Some place where people gather for worship, trade, anything like that. He needs big crowds. Barbara says, oh, you want an audience? Well, funny you should ask. There's one place that I can think of. Back inside of the theater, Penguin gathers everyone around telling them that he would like to welcome them to the new Iceberg Lounge. Tonight, for your gaming and gambling pleasures, these destitute souls have volunteered to risk it all and put their very lives on the line to win a cornucopia of consumables. More importantly, a guaranteed position within my employment as a member of my esteemed staff. But how does one earn such a lavish bounty? The crowd begins to chant, Dozer! Dozer! And Penguin says, Yes, indeed! You must best the fan favorite, Rough, Tough, Buff, and Harry, Dozer. The large dozer waves to the people, and Penguin goes on stating that after 12 rounds with a muscle machine, one way or another, their troubles will be over. As the Penguin's men begin to collect the wagers, a voice calls out, All bets are off! Penguin shouts, asking, Who dares? Oh, it's you. I should have known. Batman jumps down onto the stage, telling everyone, This is my city. I'm the law. And if any of you are threatening either, you'll answer to me. Penguin laughs, Surely you jest! But Batman punches him, stating, You must be mistaking me for someone else. Penguin falls back, shouting, My nose! He broke my nose! So Batman picks Penguin up off the ground, and Penguin yells, Things are different now! There's a new pecking order, Batman! Batman then asks, How about this? Let's make a wager. I'll go up against Dozer, and if I win, you abandon these fights. If the house wins, well, you'll get to be the bird who killed the bat. Penguin laughs, ha ha, forget it. I'm not stupid. I know Batman can take down Dozer, but can Batman take down all of them? The crowd falls silent, looking at Batman for an answer. He tells him, yes. First up is Dozer as Penguin expected. He falls with one kick to the head. Leonard then asks, what are they going to do? And Penguin tells him, it'll be fine. These people are lapping it up. Just think of all the money that's going to be coming in. But meanwhile, back at Barbara's tower, she gets the reports from all over the city that almost every gang is making its way to Penguins. Outside of the Iceberg Lounge, Batgirl watches as more and more people pile in as she says, the bugs and the vermin sure are crawling out of the woodwork tonight. The next opponent is a rather large woman as she grabs onto Batman and begins to squeeze, stating, Don't worry, baby, it'll all be over soon. So Batman headbutts her and then hits her in the throat and moves on to the next and the next and the next. Penguin watches as he's fed and he tells Letter to send in Razor Eddie. He's always been a crowd pleaser. But just like that, Razor Eddie is taken down. Leonard says they have a situation. After checking all the figures, everyone is pouring in bets. The problem is, everyone is betting on the bat, and if he does win, we won't have enough money to pay off all the people. Penguin jumps from his chair, shouting, What? He hurries down to the stage, yelling, That's enough, I'm calling an end to this show raid. I'm sorry to say, but Gotham's so-called Dark Knight is nothing but a rotten sheet. As regular customers know, these bouts are death matches. Has Batman killed a single person? No! He has cheated all of you out of your entertainment. Therefore, it pains me to say, but I declare this contest void. All bets are off. Except for the house percentage, of course. The crowds begin to draw their weapons, asking, Is this guy joking? Because if he isn't, he's a dead bird. Penguin stumbles backwards, bumping into Batman. And Batman tells him, Looks like it's just you and me. And them. Penguin asks, You planned this, didn't you? What do you want? Batman says, I want information. Whoever or whatever passes through, I need to know. It's business as usual, except we both know who's really in charge. Penguin grits his teeth. Fine, damn you! One of the men in the crowd tells Batman not to get in their way, and Batman says, You'll get your goods back, but that's all. No one touches Penguin. The man asks, or what? Are you going to get rid of us all? Batman smiles. After a few moments, the crowds begin to leave, stating that he ain't worth it. He's nothing but a sad man now. Penguin shouts to everyone that they'll be back. 
as soon as they need something. And I will make you pay through the nose! Outside, everyone begins running out and Batgirl says, Oh no, I don't like the looks of this. Oh! Batman jumps down asking, What's not to like? For once in the city, all is quiet. The one keeping tabs on everything can finally sleep. And when she sleeps, she dreams. She dreams of the times before the earthquake, when she used to soar through the buildings. And when she wakes up, she remembers who she is now, and how the days of flying through the city are now gone. As the call comes over the radio, Barbara grabs her headset, telling Rex to go ahead. Rex says that everything's been pretty quiet. There's a crowd forming at the old Wayne Omnitech building. It could be him. He's gonna go check it out. He hangs up the emergency phone and starts to head inside under the watchful eye of Batgirl. And as he does, a group of scarred men appear and they ask, have you seen? One of the men in the group sees Batgirl and she jumps in trying to save Rex, but after taking the men out, Rex is already gone. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Lockup says that she turned away another 18. They all kept saying, it's the only safe place left. Batman tells him to keep them out. Perps come in, no one else. Understand that. If I find out that even one life, no matter whose, is taken, then your life is worth nothing. Lockup laughs, stepping away from his post, stating, Sure, we'll do it your way, but just so you know, it ain't gonna last. Later, down below Arkham, Batman returns and sees Batgirl and tells her to rest. Batgirl fixes her mask, stating it's not fatigue, it's frustration. She was too slow. Batman says that she needs to be faster next time. She then asks, where do they go? All the ones they take down, what happens to them? Batman looks away and says that she doesn't want to know. After a few moments of silence, Batgirl brings up a screen stating that he took two more buildings last night. He's changed. There's no mistaking, there's no mistaking that face. He's different to scarier, like he's got nothing left to lose. He's got the muscle and it looks like he's moving south. That'll put him against Gordon's blue boys. Batman says that he's moving in on the tower. It's the last thing that represents Wayne. He will take it or destroy it. See that that never happens. Keep the tower safe, do not be seen. Batgirl then says that she can do one or the other, not both. Batman leaves telling her, then you're not worthy of the mantle. Of course, you could prove me wrong. Later at an unknown location, Rex hangs upside down and a man asks where did he come from. Rex says, bite me you freak show. The man grabs a steel poker from the fire and tells him that they will break his facade. Like them, he'll be revealed true. And like them, he will understand. Remove the blindfold. Rex sees the scowling poker inching closer to his face and he screams out, No! No! Gah! The man says, Do you see it now? Rex tells him that they can rot in hell. And the man continues, Then we shall continue. A short while later, a bell rings, loud enough that everyone on the surrounding blocks can hear. From one of those buildings, a scarred men appear, and Barbara looks out the window and she sees Rex's body thrown outside. He begs for help, and one of Jim's patrol women runs out to drag him to cover. Barbara grabs her rifle to keep watch, but before the patrol woman could grab her flare gun, she's shot. Black Mask holds out his gun, stating, You have two choices, see and live, or refuse and die. We are the true face of no man's land. It belongs to us. Barbara steadies her aim. Before she can pull the trigger, the patrol woman fires off her flare gun. Barbara takes off the safety and tightens her grip, and just then, she sees a black flash through the scope. She lowers the rifle, stating, No. And Batgirl asks Black Mask, How about you try to get through me first? Batgirl jumps through, throwing a smoke bomb and knocking some of the men down, stating that they should probably stay down. The men all start to shout, End the masks! And Black Mask goes for his gun. Batgirl snaps his arm, telling him, Talk less, fight more. As Rex and the patrol woman watch, Rex says that it's him. And the patrol woman says that no, it's not, it's her. As Batgirl finishes, she picks up Black Mask and his gun, stating that she told them not to get back up. However, she pauses for a moment and looks back. And as Barbara takes aim right at Batgirl, she lowers her rifle, asking, How could he do this to her? Once things settle down, Rex helps the patrol woman up while Jim and his men move into the cover area. After that, Jim rushes to the tower where Barbara is inside writing down information about this new Batgirl. He kicks in the door asking if everything is okay. She says, yeah, he ran after the flare went up. Later, Batman returns and he looks as Black Mask is laying in a pool of his own blood asking, little excessive. Batgirl says that the mob had to see him utterly defeated. She didn't have a choice. Would he have done any less? Batman simply tells her, no. As he gets closer, Black Mask tells Batman to remove the mask, but Batman tells him he can't. The mask is a part of me. 
Batman picks Black Mask up and throws him over his shoulder and tells Batgirl, I'll take it from here. Later, at Blackgate, Lockup yells for the people to clear out only criminals in here. One of the men down below yells, Come on! If only criminals get in, then I'll become one! The man starts to punch another man outside and Lockup tells Beast to take care of it. KG Beast aims his rifle, shooting the man in the arm and the leg and Lockup says, There, now you can come in. Anyone else? Didn't think so. The Beast leaves to bring the man in and Batman says that he'd better recover. Lockup tells him that they will give him the state's best. That another one to lock up? Batman throws Black Mass to the ground telling them, Yeah, keep him out of the general population. If he gets near any other prisoners, he might have himself a riot. Lockup picks him up stating that D-Block is still stable. They'll use it for solitary. But as Lockup leaves, Batman doesn't look back. And he tells Batgirl, You will never follow me again. You will do as I say when I say, otherwise you're out. As the night comes, Barbara sits by her window with her old bat signal stating that she knows he's out there. She knows he sees this. As the battery dies out, Batman appears. Barbara asks, Did you not think I would find out that someone is out there being me? How dare you? Batman says, You know it's not that simple. And Barbara shouts asking him, No, I don't know. All I know is that some other woman is being me. Some other woman with legs and my identity. Batman tells her, Our options are limited. She was already there when I returned. Ba Barbara asks, who is she? And Batman says, you know I can't. Barbara scoffs, I can find out. You know I can. How could you do this to me? She looks away with Batman lifting her chin, stating, no pain I've ever caused you was my choice. I never wanted to hurt you. I just need you to trust me. Barbara sighs, telling him, I always trusted you. You knew I always would. Later, at Blackgate, a voice calls out to wake up and Black Mask asks, what? The voice yells, that won't do. Stand up straight before the court. Read the charges. Another person says, your honor, this man has four counts of setting a riot and of course, attempted murder. The judge says, let's hear his plea. Black Mask says that he doesn't understand and the judge yells, guilty. Stupidity equals guilt in this court. Sentenced to the maximum to be carried out immediately. Black Mask is grabbed and then left for dead and a voice asks, next docket, your honor? The judge says that we may proceed to Tallyman. Meanwhile, in another part of Gotham, Renee Montoya has been working non-stop since the quake hit the city. Things at this point, well, they weren't so bad, if you could even call it that. But it wasn't nearly as bad as what No Man's Land had become. Montoya's efforts to protect and serve have gotten the attention of Commissioner Gordon, except not in a good way. He demanded that she take no less than a two-day break, and if he was to catch her working before then, he'd have the National Guard shoot her. Hopefully, he meant that as a joke, but with how things were, there's no way to know for sure. So what does an off-duty officer do in her spare time? Maybe she should just go home for a bit. As Montoya heads to her family's grocery store, she sees a crowd of people trying to push their way in. Montoya gets in just in time to see a man threatening to hurt her parents if they don't give him some more water. Montoya's parents stood their ground stating that the water needs to be rationed out, and that's when Montoya stepped in. She cocks her gun next to the man's head, asking, do you know how to share? It's best that you just take what you have and leave the store. Now, Montoya's gun isn't loaded since everything that happened, ammo has actually become scarce, but this man did not know that. Everyone in the store cheers and claps for her and they soon get their rations and they move on. Montoya tells her parents that she'll go out and find him and that night she does. She finds her brother with a group of what look to be looters. However, there's one man's voice in the group that she recognizes. Without a second thought, she jumps out from cover telling everyone to freeze and keep their hands where she can see them. The man's voice that she recognizes turns around. Two-Face says, relax, we're all friends here. Montoya's brother Benny runs up telling her to put the gun away and she asks if he knows who this man is. He's a cold-blooded killer. Benny says, yeah, he knows, but right now he's helping them. Just talk to him. Montoya lowers her gun and Benny introduces the two of them. Two-Face says that he believes that he's met his sister once or twice. Either way, it's a pleasure to meet her. And she did know that her gun was empty, right? But to Montoya's surprise, Two-Face was helping the group as they were searching for survivors. After flipping a coin and it coming up heads, Two-Face pushes himself even harder. Montoya keeps an eye on Two-Face, thinking to herself that she isn't sure what to make of him. He seems genuine. The group begins to split into two groups of two, and of course, Montoya is paired with Two-Face. As the two head into the destroyed building, a voice from behind a wall calls out for help. Montoya tells the man that they're coming, and then Montoya hears the ting of a coin being flipped. She tells herself that she knew it, it was just a matter of time. But Two-Face's voice cracks, telling Montoya to shine the light. She points the light to where the coin landed, and this time, it's heads. 
The two begin to dig out a hole where the man can get out, and just as soon as they do, the structure begins to give. Montoya shouts to Two-Face to get out, and as the rock and the debris fall, Montoya is trapped beneath it. Two-Face pauses for a moment, and then he flips a coin. The next morning, Montoya wakes up, and she sees herself back home after being rescued by Two-Face. Guess the coin came up heads again. Once Montoya gets dressed, she gets ready to set back out when her father stops her. He hands her a single bullet, stating that it's all he could find as she kisses him on the cheek, thanking him. The rescue group heads out to save more people, and each time Two-Face flips his coin, it comes up heads each time. But when the group stops in the next location, a criminal from back in the day stops Two-Face, asking, What are you doing? Two-Face says, Don't you remember who I am, Two-Face? Two-Face says, Yeah. Mick White. And Mick says, why don't you join us and make some real money, eh? Two-Face flips his coin, and he catches it, punching Mick, shouting, your meat! A brawl follows, but as Mick gets ready to swing his axe into Two-Face's two faces, Montoya uses her one bullet stopping Mick, and just then, Batman jumps down and Two-Face wastes no time lunging at him. Batman kicks Two-Face to the ground, and Two-Face yells that it's always him. Never give me a moment of peace! Montoya tells Batman to wait, but Two-Face flips his coin, and before Two-Face can catch it, Montoya snatches it. Batman picks up Two-Face, and Two-Face demands to know, What did it say? Tell me, what did it say? Batman tells Montoya nicely done, but Montoya asks if he can let Two-Face go. Just trust her on it. It'll be okay. Batman asks, Do you realize what you're doing? And Montoya says, Yes, I just have to try. Please, I can reach him. After a gruff sigh, Batman takes off his restraints and says he'll be watching. Two-Face asks her again, what did the coin say? Montoya tells him it doesn't matter. He doesn't need to know. He was helping him. That doesn't change anything. All he needs to do is finish what he started. She'll keep the coin for now, just until they finish. And with that, Montoya helps Two-Face up, and they get back to work. Meanwhile, in yet another part of Gotham City, with food slowly growing more and more difficult to find, more people in Gotham take it upon themselves to scavenge for what scraps they can find. But for Melanie and Jeff, things are just a little different. They didn't even live in the city. He only came to make sure that Jeff's mother was safe, and as it would turn out, Jeff's mother left a few days before the bridges blew up. He lowers himself into a home and says that once they get what they need, they'll be gone. What's the worst that could happen? Melanie jumps down next, and the two of them look through the home, with Melanie noticing a picture of a person who might live there. She picks up the photo and says that it's a man with green hair, white skin, and a funny-looking car. Jeff says that it's probably just some carny from an amusement park who lived here. Besides, this place is covered in dust. No one's been here for months. Melanie says that she's not so sure on that. They should probably just leave, and Jeff tells her one quick look and they will leave. He opens up a door to the next room and he finds a dozen broken spotlights with a trail of bloody footprints. Melanie grabs Jeff, shouting it's time to go, but Jeff stops right before the fridge, stating, wait. He opens it up, grabs a buck, and not seeing the label on it that was reading donor organs. He peels the plastic back, stating that it smells, and it looks like kielbasa or bratwurst. Melanie yells, come on, we have to leave. The TV here works, but all it's showing is some channel of people processing meat. Just then the phone rings. Neither of them answer. Melanie says they shouldn't be here. She begins to run back, but she steps on a trap door, falling through it into a pool of water. Jeff reaches down to help Melanie out, stating that it's a dumb place for a jacuzzi, but neither of them see that the water below is filled with dead piranhas. As Melanie goes and dries off, she hears Jeff calling out to her to come quick. She follows the voice into what looks to be a showroom, and in the middle of the room is a Robin costume, and a crowbar with a plaque reading, The Day I Won. Melanie takes a closer look at the mannequin, stating that it's not real, right? And just then, the phone begins to ring. Neither of them answer it, and Jeff says, Okay, just one last room to check and we can go. I swear. Oh, God. Melanie runs over to where Jeff is, and on the door is a note that states, Hostages. He opens it up to see two dozen decomposing bodies tied up. Jeff grabs Melanie by the hand and they begin to run to the exit and that's when the phone rings a third time. Jeff stops and says that maybe it's the police or the National Guard and Melanie tells him that she has a bad feeling about this but as Jeff goes to pick it up, his hand is knocked away by a battering. Batgirl tells them, you need to leave now. Melanie and Jeff climb back out the window with Batgirl tying a string to the phone. She jumps onto the ledge, and when the three of them are away, she tugs on the string. A second later, the house explodes with a loud boom. And as the smoke clears, Batgirl tells the two of them that they're lucky to be alive. The Joker doesn't like squatters. Follow this map, and they'll leave a safe area. The two slump down, and Jeff hands Melanie a soda, stating that he found this. Drink it. It'll calm her nerves. The Joker's place. No way. It's a shame all that food is wasted, and suddenly, Melanie begins to cackle. Jeff turns around asking what's so funny, and when he looks at Melanie, all he can see is the giant grin on her face, and she laughs louder and louder. 
And louder! And louder! <laughs> As the world crumbles around him, Harold thinks of his mother when the earthquakes began. Her cold, icy voice rising into a scream, telling him to get out of her sight. Get out! Those are the last words to him before Gotham fell. He doesn't know what happened, just that it was bad. He pulls himself out of the rubble, seeing Batman's things broken, and then he finds his tool belt, which is good. He has a lot of work to do, and when he works, he's happy. He begins to work on the Batmobile, and Alfred tells him not to even bother. Even though Harold can't speak, Alfred understands him, but it is broken. Harold is the individual in this timeline that has been helping Batman with his tools and keeping things up and running. So Alfred sighs, stating that he knows, but there are more important matters that concerns him and Harold. More important than fixing things, Harold thought to himself. But then, what should he do? Alfred tells him, please, just go away until he calls him. So Harold's mother's voice rings out in his mind, and Harold leaves. He has not seen daylight since Batman brought him into the cave, but that was of his own choice. He hardly notices the strange feeling of the breeze hitting his face because it feels like he's leaving the only home that he's ever known. With nothing else to do, Harold takes his tools and he walks. There's nothing else to do. Batman's not here anymore. That's when Harold sees it, a city, a whole city, broken, needing to be fixed. So Harold begins to run because he knows he has a lot of work to do. And when he works, Harold's happy. The Joker stands in frustration, trying to figure out what to do. He can't poison the water supply because the water supply is already polluted. He can't foul the air because the air is already soot soup. He can't terrorize the citizens because the citizens are already scared out of their gourds. Their city has fallen. And on top of that, he's lonely. Ever since he left Arkham Asylum, he's been waiting for him, like a puppy waiting for its master. He even went ahead and built this giant extra special death trap for him. It's got knives and bullets and explosives and acid and oh, the lasers. <laughs> I love the lasers. But it's... Batman going to be so unmannerly cruel and forget his old pals? Well, then they'll just have to make him come. Meanwhile, at the Gotham City docks, Azrael looks at a human figure imprint in the snow where the man that he fought, Kelebex, fell. He pushed the monster over the ledge, but it would seem that Kelebex landed in this snowbank. He's still probably injured, but clearly not enough to stop him from escaping. The tracks are leading north, and that's where he needs to go. As Azrael studies the area, Batman asks, Did you lose something? Azrael explains the situation with Kelebex, but Azrael is on his own mission. So Batman tells him first, before locating Kelebex, You have to find the Joker. He's somewhere north. Azrael thinks to himself, Well, Kelebex headed in that direction, so maybe I'll get lucky and run into the both of them. If only meeting a pair of ruthless, sadistic, merciless, homicidal maniacs would be considered lucky. So Azrael searches all day. Passing by former hospital inmates released into the world because those who took care of them fled the city. A dull anger grows inside of him at the sight of that. There should have been a better job done of getting these people out, or the caretakers didn't care. As Azrael passes through the alleyway, a woman stops him asking, Are you Batman? Azrael tells her, No, I'm uh, one of his helpers. Why? The woman tells him, Well, there was a clown a little while ago. He told me that if I saw Batman to tell him the Joker is waiting in Forest Park, are you sure you're not Batman? Azrael hurries off telling her, I'm sure, but don't worry. I'll be back, hopefully. Meanwhile, over in the park, the Joker shouts asking, Where is he? I put the word out, squandered jelly beans like they were a hundred dollar bills. And I'm still here, right now, waiting. In the old days, he would pop up when he wasn't wanted, but now he's Mr. Nowhere. The Joker eats a handful of his jelly beans, with a young boy asking, Can I get out of here now? Joker tells him, of course not! The Joker's enforcer asks, why do we have a kid in a trap? I mean, wasn't it meant for? And the Joker shouts, you idiot! A man would think that you just got out of the loading bin! Well, actually, that isn't far from the truth, but that's besides the point. Let me run it down for you! Batman is going to show up to rescue Sweetums here, and when he does, the bars are going to come down and lock him inside! Then the spring-loaded blades are going to shoot out from every angle, machine guns are going to fire, acid sprays from the floor, and laser beams crisscross the whole area. Finally, for the big finish, six pounds of plastic explosives. 
Next stop, Cratersville! <laughs> the enforcer asks, what about the kid? The Joker tells him, well, when you fish for a trout, do you worry about the worm? Just then, the Joker hears a voice telling him, release the boy. Joker spins back yelling, he hasn't stood me up yet! Now, I know you're gonna have to go rescue the boy, but first, there's a custom we must honor. Go beat him up, boys! The Enforcer runs forward yelling, Gotcha, Joker! A second later, the Enforcer's thrown back with a bloody nose. Joker then says, Okay, now that we got that out of the way, time to move on to... And that's when Azriel steps out of the shadows telling him, I don't have time for games. And the Joker's shocked, he's stunned, he yells, Wait! You're not him! He sent some sleazy replacement! I'm... I'm a little hurt! No, this cannot be! You're not worthy of my genius! Did I mention how hurt I am? Okay, so here's the deal. You can either crawl into one of those pipes over there or the kid gets snapped fast and forever. Azrael thinks to himself that he could drop the Joker easy. The Joker could be bluffing about the boy, but he isn't. With no other choice, Azrael climbs into one of the pipes nearby and the Joker's enforcer wields one side shut. As he finishes that one side, Azrael begins to throw his weight into the side of the pipe and he ends up rolling down the hill. As the Joker goes on telling him, I'm, I'm still really, really hurt. Like, he sent a why did it, me and Batman, we have a thing? The Enforcer returns and the Joker asks, Are you done already? The Enforcer tells him, Well, not exactly. The pipe went into the river. And the Joker says, But both sides were sealed up, right? Right? The Enforcer tells him, Well, half of it was. So the Joker starts laughing, telling him, that's, <laughs> that's, that's fine. But, but what I would like you to do now is crawl into the trap and get Sweetums. The Enforcer asks, wouldn't I get sliced up and shot up? And the Joker asks, would I really do that? But before the Enforcer could climb into the trap, he's grabbed and punched again. Azrael tells him, Batman told me to nail the Joker. Nail him hard. And the Joker laughs. <laughs> He does care! So as Azrael gets ready to hit him, the boy then asks, Can I go now? It's getting cold in here. Azrael watches as the Joker runs away, and he gets ready to follow. But then he stops and he tells the boy, Sure, I'll get you out of here. Later by the nearby church, Azrael takes his mask off, stating that he failed. It took him four hours to figure out how to disarm the trap, and by the time he was done, the Joker was gone. But Batman tells him, No, you saved the child's life. That is no failure. When we do the things that we do, we must choose between vengeance and compassion. The choice you made, it was the right one, John Paul. Azrael does not know what to say, whether to smile or merely nod. But by the time that he decides, Batman is already gone. And then, he moved slowly into the cold morning, determined to finish his quest, to find Nick Scratch and Kelebex. Once upon a time, there was a noble knight who had always fought for the people of his land. The knight had a squire who served him faithfully, and more often than not, without question. The young boy scoffs, asking, So this squire is just a dork? Who would believe this old geezer? And then he hits the young girl next to him. Alfred grabs the boy by the nose, pulling out a bouquet of flowers, telling him, If you wish to win a young lady's affections, you must start with flowers. He gives the young girl the flowers, and he clears his throat, stating, Now, where was I? Oh yes. The squire served the knight. The relationship was somewhat of a partnership. The squire was proud to serve the knight, but then calamity came over the kingdom, and the knight's castle was destroyed. A great evil fell upon the land, and the people needed a knight more than ever before. But the knight, struck with the loss of his kingdom, retreated to end to the wounds of his soul. Many asked, where did he go? Why has he forsaken his land? What they did not know, nor even the knight, was that he could never leave the land behind. That it would take the knight time to realize this. So now, our story must follow the squire. A knight would return the squire, though, but with his lineage. He stepped out into the world to do what he can until the knight's arrival. He did what he could to help those in need, relying more on his brain than brawn. The squire used his knowledge of medicine to aid those who were hurt. But there was something else the squire was good at, and that was being a spy. He charted the lands, drawing maps, and he watched. And he watched for a long time. The young boy then shouts, Boring! What kind of a lame story is this? Didn't the squire do anything? And Alfred asks, Would you rather hear about how the squire fought in the knight's stead? And the boy tells him, Well, that would be something at least. So Alfred tells him, Very well. There was a time when he fought. He did. Try. The squire saw a group of bad people capturing a group of men and women and thought back to when he would have left this sort of thing to the knight. But without him there, the squire knew that he couldn't idly stand by. The squire's stomach would twist and turn as he snuck up, not knowing what could happen. He attacked, 
leaving only the Brute to deal with. Fortunately for the Squire, though, the Brute was not the sharpest stick in the bundle. While the Brute rampaged in search of the Squire, the Squire quietly freed those captured. But the Brute returned, quartering the Squire as the people fled. The Brute clearly overpowered the Squire, and he was knocked down, and he expected that he would die. But that's when the Knight returned. He defeated the brute with ease, telling the man that he shall never touch his squire again. Alfred then bows, telling his listeners, Thank you. And the young boy yells, Wait! That's not an ending! And Alfred picks up his bags, telling him, Of course not. It is but a beginning. And now it is time for bed. As Alfred quietly sneaks away into the shadows, he opens up a secret passage. And Bruce asks him, How's the arm? Alfred tells him, compared to the injuries that he's endured, Tis but a scratch. And Batman tells him, Good. Starting tomorrow, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. With turf wars becoming more and more of an everyday thing, there are few who try to stop its destructive nature from claiming one of the last glimmers of hope. Batgirl fights against a group of thugs from the Zaz gang, but the more that she knocks them down, the more get back up to replace them. The hours they feel like days, with no shortage of gang members, Batgirl is forced to retreat. The gang cheers in their victory, and the first order of business is to mark their new territory. But as one of the thugs goes to spray a house, he finds himself at the other end of a gun. The older man tells the thug to get away, and the thug runs back to his friends. And that older man is Sergeant William S. Riley, known around the neighborhood as Sarge. Sarge never takes kindly to trespassers. Sarge lived in this neighborhood, this very house, longer than anyone can remember. When development started, Sarge built his house on the ground up, and he and his wife lived happily together. The only thing that was missing was children. Thankfully, the neighborhood had children to spare, and Sarge adopted them as his own. Especially kids like little Stevie down the block, whose own parents didn't have much time for him. The house had become a home. Despite everything changing, nothing and no one would ever make him leave. But of course, when fending off any gang member, they always come back tenfold. The Zaz gang returned and demanded that Sarge pay tribute with food for his disrespectful actions earlier. Sarge thought about it as he looked over the neighborhood. If he fought back, would they follow his example, or would his death only prove its futility? With little choice left, Sarge agreed to let the raiders take what food he had in his home. After they left, he looked at his destroyed home. Fridge cleaned out, drawers scattered about, they took it all, or so they thought. He pulls back on the undisturbed rug on the floor and opens up a hatch underneath. Inside was all the food a person could need to survive in a place known as No Man's Land. The neighborhood had seen so many changes over the years. People had come and went. Houses were replaced by large businesses, but no matter what, Sarge would always stay. And one night, Sarge noticed the drug dealers were peddling their wares. The thing that caught his eye, though, was one of the buyers. It was little Stevie, all grown up. Sarge chased the drug dealer away with his gun, and with disappointment, he told Stevie to go home. Sarge wasn't scared of some shady people. He fought in wars. He watched as one group of bad men were replaced by another. The Blue Boys, former Gotham City cops, tried to create some law, but the Killer Croc gang ran them out. Next were the Street Devils chasing out the Killer Croc gang. Except when they demanded tribute from him, Sarge paused as he held his gun up. He knew one of those thugs. It was Stevie. He lowered his gun telling Stevie that if he wanted to get past him, he would have shot. But they both know that he won't do that. But Stevie's friend pushed him to shoot. And as Stevie held his gun up, he trembled. Before Stevie could do anything, a group of thugs from the Joker gang jump in and they gun down both Stevie and his friend. And once that shooting stops, the Joker himself walks in stating, I'm so sorry about the mess. These gentlemen were misinformed about who's really in charge. Really like the style, though. Sarge told him that he didn't much care for his. And Joker laughed. <laughs> That's the spirit! But I can't help myself believe without a souvenir. He gently pulls the gun away from Sarge, telling his men to be nice and clean up. And so, the war continues. This was not the first tragedy that Sarge will see, nor will it be the last. Tomorrow will likely bring more of the same, or maybe not. Who knows? And no matter what happens, Sarge knows where he'll be. Right here, at home. From the sky, Superman watches, seeing that things are much worse than he feared. Poor people have been cast off by their own government, huddled into submission by petty tyrants, but not anymore. After seeing the Mad Hatter attempting to take what little a man had, Superman stepped in. He stopped the Mad Hatter and he told the people that they can take back what is rightfully theirs. But as Superman helped one man up, he asked, what does he do? And the man asked, do? These people were in such distress that they nearly forgot what they did before the earthquake. And the man tells Superman that he was an engineer, chief engineer at a power plant. 
And that's when Superman sees him, Batman. Batman asked, what did he think he was doing? As Superman told him, I came here to help, of course. Batman told him, you need to leave. You're out of your element. However, Superman wouldn't leave. These people needed help and he was going to give it to them. Not him or anyone was going to stop him. Superman said to show that he was serious and Batman smiled back asking, what makes you think I can't stop you? Superman paused for a moment. Batman is bluffing, isn't he? Batman reaches for something as Superman tenses up, but as Batman shows his hand, it has a battering in it. He tells him, 24 hours, do all the good you can. I'll be waiting right here when the time comes. As Batman leaves, Superman knows that he can prove that he can do this, that he can bring change, that he can save Gotham. He flies back down to the man from before and he smiles. And he tells him, I need your help. We're going to rebuild that power station and bring light back to Gotham. Within four hours, the once broken man has found a purpose. Working, sweating, fighting to win back the city. But as the man tightens the last bolt, he says that that should do it. As Superman dusts off a hard hat stating, I found this, pretty sure it belongs to you. The man puts it on and it reads, Chief Engineer. He says, thank you, and he throws the switch. The lights slowly begin to flicker on and after a few moments, they begin to fade. The engineer checks the system, stating that this doesn't make any sense. Everything is working fine. There must be something interfering with the line coming in. Superman rushes to find the source of the problem, to find what he missed. And what he did miss was that there are other people inside of the power plant. Superman sees the problem. It's Mr. Freeze, because those with power control the city, and Mr. Freeze won't have that. Inside, the large men with guns surround the engineer asking, So what do you do? The engineer stares in disbelief and the men tell him that he's the man with the power. So what does he want them to do? The engineer tries to tell him that he doesn't want anything, but just then a man stumbles in, running over to him, begging him to please hook him up first. As the engineer tries to explain that he'll get to everyone, another man pushes forward stating that he just wants him to hook him up first or he'll knock his head in. The group of armed men begin to see this and they step in, grabbing the threatening man, telling the engineer, it's okay boss, we got this. The armed men then begin to have everyone get in line so that they can offer tribute. But as Superman returns, he sees what things have become. He flies down asking, What is going on? These people, you have it all wrong. Make them understand it doesn't work like this. And the engineer tells him, How? Superman looks back at the crowd of people and they all push through him to offer what they can to be the first to have their power restored. With a heavy sigh, Superman flies up to the tower to meet Batman and he tells him, You're right. I don't understand the people. These people, they're not ready. And Batman tells him, it took me longer to figure that out myself. So Superman then asks, how are you going to do it? How are you going to bring Gotham back? And Batman tells him, I'm not sure, but I'll find a way. I hope. As a man takes a wooden plank and he begins to beat another, he shouts that I will teach him for messing with him. We don't deserve to live. Committing such crimes in certain areas will bring on the eyes of those who control it. And in this case, it's Batman. Batman tells the man to freeze, but like most criminals, he runs away. Without giving much resistance, Batman captures the man and says, Okay, you got me. Gonna take me to Blackgate? Guess a murderer like me deserves to go there. But then Batman pauses. Something's wrong. The brazines of the crime. The ease at which he took them down. The chatty demeanor. He turns back and checks the body and he asks, What game are you playing at? Rigor mortis is set in. This person has been dead for at least three days. He spins back, grabbing the man, shouting, you didn't kill him, did you? And the man shouts, No, I didn't. I just found him and dragged him out. I was just trying to get sent to Blackgate. Everyone knows that it's safe there. Batman unties the man's restraints and the man says, Wait, I'm not going to prison? What kind of hero are you? The people need you and you're just leaving. Why do all the murderers get the breaks? If I die, it'll be on your hands, Batman. But as Batman leaves, he thinks, Could the man be right? This sort of thing has never happened before. As he tries to make sense of it, he almost misses the message left by Batgirl on where they're meeting. Just then he hears the sounds of a crying baby and he turns to follow those cries. He finds two women fighting over the baby. One yells to the other one that she left the baby alone, while the other one yells that she tried to steal the baby. Batman jumps down, picking up the baby, asking, Who does this child belong to? Neither woman answer. And the first shouts that she should have him because she's the better mother. That's child endangerment. And the second yells that she had him first. That woman is a kidnapper. She can't be a mother. Kidnapping is against the law. As the two explain their case, Batman tells them that they're both right. But you're also both wrong. Because of that, I will take the child and neither of you will have him. Batman leaves to the meeting place, but as Batgirl arrives, she asks, Whose baby is that? Batman doesn't answer and she says, Right, won't ask. Anyway, I ran into our mutual friend the other night. Jim asked me to give you a message. 
Stay away. You're not welcome at GCPD territory. Batgirl then asks, why would he say that? But when Batman doesn't answer, she says, right. Just thought you'd like to know. Later, as Batman returns home, Alfred senses that Batman is distracted and asks, what's the matter? Batman steps out of the shower telling him, it's nothing. And Alfred tells him, I beg to differ. You put your shirt on inside out. A rare occurrence to say the least. Batman sighs as he sits down stating, it's confusion. I'm not sure what I'm doing anymore. Even Gordon doesn't want me around. I swore an oath to fight for justice. I'm not so sure that I can keep that oath. If I even can, what good is an oath that tears us apart? Alfred finishes changing the baby and he tells him, You remind me of your father. Sit down and take off the mask. Because a story of Dr. Thomas Wayne should be told to his son. As a community service, Thomas would work three nights a week in a clinic in Burnley. One of those nights, there was an emergency and the prognosis was grim. A boy needed a very specific drug immediately if he was going to have a chance of survival. But the nearest hospital was far away. There was a pharmacy around the corner that had the drug, but it was closed for the night. Thomas had taken an oath to do all that he could to help those that were sick, but did that include breaking and entering, stealing? Thomas made his decision and he threw a brick through the window and found the drug. However, the child died regardless. Thomas returned to the store and left a note explaining what happened. His intentions were good. Despite the outcome, surely the owner would understand. The next day, Thomas received a call from the store owner. He says what he did was fine, but because of that, the store was robbed. Now he would go to the police and the matter would go public or Thomas would have to pay the man the amount and they could keep the matter to themselves. Thomas was a trusting man and he agreed to pay, but the store owner, he saw a sign of weakness. He would call Thomas and demand more and more money, and each time Thomas would pay. He did this to keep the embarrassment of what he did out of public view. One day Thomas took a shower and put his shirt on inside out, claiming that he just had a lot on his mind. So as a concerned butler, Alfred followed Thomas one night when he went to go pay the store owner. Alfred told Thomas that he wasn't the criminal here, the store owner was. Perhaps they could work something out. So the next day, Thomas went to the store owner while he was working, and he told him that he wasn't going to pay him any more money. The owner said, fine, they would just call the police. But that's when Alfred, dressed as a police officer, came in, and Thomas told the owner that he already brought one. As it would turn out, the store owner forged Thomas's name on the note to blackmail him. Thomas decided to have the store owner arrested in front of his customers. The store owner says, there, there must be a misunderstanding, and handed Thomas the note. Alfred finished the story stating that in that space of a month, his father had committed vandalism, breaking and entering, and theft. He did all of this to uphold his Hippocratic Oath. The oath that he had sworn before God. The oath that was tearing him apart. And later, Batman returns to the spot where they took the baby and sees the two women still there. He asks them what would they each do to keep the baby, and both women said that they would do anything. So then Batman says, It's decided. You are both responsible for the child. They both shout that neither could trust the other one, and Batman says, you said you would do anything, and anything means working together for the good of the child. Because in this place, a baby needs two parents, not one. When one is looking for food, the other is to care for the child. Agreed? The women look at each other and they say, okay. Swear to me, make an oath, as God is your witnesses. May you burn in hell if you break it. They both place their hand on Batman's, and Batman hands the child over, as the women introduce themselves to each other. One watches Batman leave, stating that he doesn't know much about babies but he sure does know something about people. It's been over four months now in No Man's Land and this winter has been one of the worst that Gotham has ever seen. Actually, that's not true. The worst were the winters of 88 and 67. What makes this one worse than those back then is people at least had central heat and no one can escape this time. Even with waters freezing, there are still mines out there and they have no issues detonating. So no one even bothers to try and escape the city. They just wait and hope for spring to come. And if they can't live that long, well. But while some try to figure out how to survive these cold nights, others are plotting. They're plotting for control over the lawless areas of Gotham. Two of those people are Penguin and Two-Face, and they're currently at war with each other. One day though, Two-Face met with Penguin out in the field of battle stating that they don't have to fight. There's something that he can offer. Batman's land. Penguin lets out a laugh telling him, That is very unlike you. What exactly would you be getting out of this, Mr. Harvey? Two-Face shouts, I will destroy the Batman. And Penguin laughs, <laughs> You really do take things personally, don't you? Can you even deal with him with your current numbers? Two-Face tells him that he can, and he guarantees it. I just need two days and some help. First of which would be to spread some false information. 
So the next day, Barbara contacts this new Batgirl to reach Batman with information. But she will only speak with Batman directly. Batgirl tells her that she understands that she isn't liked, but they cannot let that interfere with their jobs. Barbara shouts telling Batgirl to just have Batman call her Oracle out. As Barbara ends the call, Batman steps out of the shadows, stating, That was unprofessional. If she has intel, we need it. Now. Barbara lays out a map of the city, stating that their new friend Penguin says that Two-Face is on the move. This has already been supported by one of her field agents. Two-Face is claiming something about a trial by combat, and it's happening tomorrow night at City Hall. Figured that he'd want to check it out. Batman turns to leave, and Barbara asks, Do you want to know what I think? And Batman coldly tells her, No. As he leaves, Barbara sighs to herself, stating, I think this is a trap. Meanwhile, in the south, Jim sits alone on a rooftop while Montoya steps out, stating that she heard that he was looking for her. Jim directly asks if she trusts him, and she tells him, absolutely. Jim says, good, because I need you to do something. Something where if you were caught, I would have to deny ever asking you. No one can know. Montoya tells him that he can trust her. And later that night, Batman watches over Two-Face's gang, and it appears that he is holding a fighting contest with the prize being a working 45 ACP hollow point bullet. So everyone will make their bets on who will win, the Rhino or Isabel Cheranova. Isabel, a woman who worked as a spy and has implants to help forward information back to Russia, uses her combat skills to easily dodge all of Rhino's attacks. Rhino does manage to get a kick into the face, but before he can end the fight, three batarangs are thrown into his arm, followed by a kick to the back. Batman shouts, that is enough, grabbing Isabella by the hand and swinging to a nearby building. He begins to pull back on the cord of the grappling hook when Isabella takes out a metal baton, cracking Batman in the back of the head. I'm very sorry for this. A short while later, reports begin to flood into the clock tower that Batman's territory is now being overrun. The first event was Two-Face marching his men through the north into Batman's territory. The second was Jim's Blue Boys launching a surprise offensive against Penguin's south borders, but he's paying with high casualties. The third event is that while Jim was attacking Penguin in the south, Penguin was attacking Batman's north sector. An agent tells Barbara that Batgirl is there holding her own, but Batman is nowhere to be found. Penguin pushes forward, telling Batgirl that unfortunately for her, this land belongs to me now. Batgirl shouts, asking, What about the truce you were supposed to have with Batman? And Penguin asks, Where is he? It would be in your best interest to surrender now, girly. Penguin then brings out a hostage, telling her, And if you don't hurry up soon, this man might spring a leak. Batgirl throws a battering, snatching the spear that the thug was holding behind the hostage, and Penguin shouts, Kill her! Batgirl quickly grabs one of the men holding a crossbow and forces him to shoot it, hitting Penguin in the leg. Just then, Two-Face steps out, telling Penguin to leave now. Penguin shouts, telling him that this was supposed to be his land. We had a deal! And Two-Face tells him, I also had a deal with the Bat. See, while he's here bleeding out, Gordon and his cops just annexed your southern border. Which means instead of doubling your land, I just reduced it by half. Now leave before you are killed on sight, Penguin. So Penguin packs up and leaves, and Two-Face checks his watch. And sees Batgirl staring down at him from a roof. He waves, and one of Barbara's agents asks if she's going to fight him. Batgirl asks, what, alone? No. Tell Orica that Batman's territory is lost. Elsewhere, Batman begins to wake back up, and he finds himself tied to a pipe on a building with none of his tools. He jumps back up on the pipe, putting it in front of himself, and begins to rip it off of the building. He tosses it, suiting back up, and that's when he returns to his territory, but he quickly finds his tags crossed out, and replaced by two faces. He then sees some of his men tied up and shot with arrows, and the words, Tails, you lose, written above them. Later that night, Batman takes the bodies of his men and buries them out in the cemetery, but watching from afar is Batgirl. As Batman prays, Batgirl quietly walks off, but then is called by Batman, telling her, I trusted you. Batgirl looks back, and when she does, Batman is nowhere to be seen. Back at the clock tower, Barbara checks in on some of her agents when one, a muted Cassandra, returns with her report. Barbara asks where she's been and Cassandra smiles holding out an apple. Barbara takes Cassandra and works on her speech, but just as she's trying to sound out the word stop, Jim enters telling her that he needs to talk to her. Barbara tells Cassandra that they're going to have to continue her speech lesson tomorrow, but as Cassandra's leaving, she sees a man standing outside the tower and quickly ducks away before being seen. She watches the man and follows him until he enters an old, rundown building. Just as Jim leaves, 
The man looks out from the window of the building, holding a rifle pointed right at Jim. As the man lines up his sights, Cassandra jumps in front of Jim before the trigger is pulled and the man hesitates. One of the officers blows his whistle, pointing up at the window, and the other officers then open fire. One of the bullets hits the man in the shoulder, and he shrugs it off as the officer kicks in the door. The man turns back, punching the officer in the stomach, and then grabs him by the head, snapping his neck. Also, at this time, over at Two-Face's newly claimed territory, Batman leans down, telling him that he's running out of options. Two-Face struggles to speak through the gag covering his mouth, and he frees his arms from being tied down, but Batman walks off, telling him that those people were slaughtered. How are you going to avenge those men? There's no judge to sentence, no jury to convict. So what's left? Two-Face tries to move, but Batman picks up one of Two-Face's coins, telling him it might be nice not to have to choose. He flips it and catches it, but then before revealing it, he throws the coin, telling Two-Face, Do not force my hand. We both would lose. Over at the police station, Jim tells Cassandra, No, she doesn't understand. I just need to know who attempted to kill me. Cassandra holds up a picture of a wolf's head and then points at it. Jim sighs, stating that this is going nowhere, but Barbara takes the picture, stating that she recognizes this as the mark of Cain. Jim stops Cain, as in David Cain, but Cain shoots girls. Why wouldn't you shoot this one? Cassandra points at Jim and then Barbara and then points at the mark and then back to herself. Barbara simply puts it all together. Are you David Cain's daughter? Jim puts on his coat, telling her that they're going to have to go out and find David Kane. But Cassandra runs in front of him, stealing the keys out of his hand. Before Jim could even ask what's going on, Cassandra runs outside of the door, locking it behind her. She turns around to see David Kane standing there with a gun pointed at the door and him motioning for her to get out of the way. She braces herself, so David starts to shoot. And each of the bullets barely misses her. And when he's out, Cassandra lunges forward, disarming her father and punching him in the face. She thinks back to when she was younger and killed a man by ripping out his throat. And as she looks at the blood dripping from her hand, she screams, Stop! David slowly gets up asking, Did, did you, did you speak? Can you understand me? Just then, Jim kicks open the door. David goes for his gun. But before he can raise it, Cassandra runs full force into her father, picking him up and jumping out the window. As the two begin to tumble to the pavement below, David tells Cassandra that that was a nice tackle. He taught her well. But before they could hit the ground, David grabs onto Cassandra's hand as Batman throws a batarang around David's legs to stop them. The weight of the two of them starts to cause the wire to dig into Batman's skin. But as Cassandra hangs there, she pushes herself, forcing David to let go. He shouts for her, and then Cassandra sees Black. A short while later, she wakes up in the cemetery with Batman asking, Who are you? What is your connection to Kate? Speak! After a few moments of silence, Batman then puts two and two together. Can you speak English? She motions to her mouth and then fist, signifying that she can't speak. And Batman says, you can't speak any language other than the language of violence. Cassandra throws a punch and Batman blocks it. And he tells her that whatever her involvement is, it's over now. Stay out of the way. Cassandra draws the mark of Kane in the dirt. And then Batman draws Two-Face's tag, stating that this man hired Kane, which makes Kane his problem now. But instead of walking away, Cassandra begins fighting Batman again, landing a few blows, but ultimately ending with Batman going for her neck. He stops before grabbing her, telling her, I could stop him. I could stop them all. Later, David Kane sets himself up to attempt his assassination on Jim Gordon again, but before he can pull the trigger, he stops asking, How long have you been standing there? Batman walks out, Long enough for you to stop yourself. The two begin to fight, savagely beating one another, when just before they collide one last time, they both punch bags of money. David looks back to see Cassandra wearing a mask and he calls out to her. She holds out her hand to stop him from coming forward and points at the money again. Batman picks up one of the coins and sees that the bag is filled with all of Two-Face's silver dollars. He smiles. Nice touch. Later that night, Barbara shows Cassandra a picture of herself when she used to be Batgirl. She says, yeah, that was her. A long time ago. Take it. Batman then appears and tells Barbara, Call us. Now. Barbara says that they're going to need more time, and so Batman leaves, telling her that they have 24 hours. If they can't do it, then they aren't up to the task. But for now, he has business to attend to. Over on the south side of the city, Jim sits on his patio, staring at his potted plants. His wife Sarah comes out asking if he's ready for bed, but Jim tells her in a minute. He sets the plant back down, and he looks back to see Batman. He tells him to go away, but Batman doesn't move. So Jim turns, telling him, I don't care whatever it is. 
I didn't ask for your help against Kane, and I'm sure as hell not going to ask for it now. Now get out of here. Batman tries to speak, but Jim shouts over him, telling him, No! Leave! So Batman stands there as Jim pulls back, punching him across the face. Batman turns to leave, hanging his head, telling him, Two-Face isn't an ally that you can trust. And Jim looks to him, telling him, Neither were you. And back at the clock tower, Azrael, Cassandra, Nightwing, and Robin meet with Barbara. And they all begin to joke about how long it's been until Batman finally arrives. He steps out of the shadows, telling them all that it's good to see them. You've come far. And right now, you all need to stay here. Nightwing, you're coming with me. So, as the sun comes up, our mysterious Batgirl prays before getting some much-needed sleep. She jumps down into her apartment, taking off her mask when a voice tells her, It's harder than you thought, isn't it? Huntress. Not working out like you planned. Huntress turns back, asking, You knew? Batman tells her, Yes. Six people are dead. The fault is as much mine as it is yours. If you want to keep that cow and become our new Batgirl, I need to trust you. I have to know that you're going to be following orders. Trying isn't enough. You were supposed to stop Black Mask at the tower. You failed. I told you not to follow me when I took Black Mask into custody. You disobeyed. I told you to protect our territory, our people. But now Two-Face commands our land. Huntress throws the mask at him, yelling, You blame me for all of that? Do you think that I don't understand? I can't just forget those who died. I can't sleep at night. I can't forgive myself. You left me alone to fight more than 200 of Two-Face's goons. What was I supposed to do, Batman? And Batman tells her, More. You lack discipline. You lack control. You're too emotional. If you're going to remain with me, with us, you need to fall in line. Otherwise, you're out. Huntress shouts, asking, it's always your way, isn't it? Either I do your lapdog thing or nothing. I won't take orders from you, not anymore. I'm not going to do what you want. Don't ask because I can't. So Batman tells her, Then you need to stay the hell away from it all. It's the only way. Batman leaves and Hunter sits at the windowsill, stating that she can't do either. Outside, Nightwing tells Batman that he knows that he can't push her like that and expect her to play along. She isn't going to stay out of it. She's going to go rogue. So Batman tells him, Yes. And Nightwing tells him, Uh-oh, I know that tone. That's the I have a plan tone. A second later, Batman and Nightwing jump down, and Batman looks at everyone, telling them, I need your help. I thought I could. I thought I needed to do this alone, but I was wrong. No man's land is too big, too dark. The only way to bring light to Gotham is for all of us to work together. All of us, including her. Robin will work with himself on a special project in Robinson Park. Within 24 hours, Nightwing will be inside a black cage. Within 48 hours, he will have it under his control. Azrael and her new friend will find out what Nicholas Scratch is up to and put a stop to him. The man most responsible for Gotham City being declared a no man's land. Any questions? As no one says anything, Batman holds out a small box to Cassandra telling her, This is a sacred trust. Remember that. Honor it. Cassandra opens up the box, and inside is the Batgirl costume. Once Cassandra's done changing, Batman tells her, It's time we all move out. There's work to be done. Even though Azrael knows it's a dream, he doesn't wake up, because it's kind of interesting. It's him out in the Wild West as a gunman in search of Scratch. The two men stand by the dusty roads, and when the word draw is shouted, Azrael slaps leather and fires three shots. As Scratch manages to get off one, he falls to the ground, telling him that it looks like he's cashing in his chips and heading for that last roundup. He was a plumb fool for thinking that he could draw against the angelic kid. Just then, Azrael's name is called by Leslie Thompson, asking what is he reading. She reads a passage and tosses the western book to the side, telling him that if it smelt better, it at least would be garbage. Why bother with such filth? Azrael tells her, well, I kind of like the idea of six-shooter justice. Elsewhere, a thug holds up a man stating that he looks awfully familiar. He looks like a cop that got busted back in the 15th precinct. The man holds out his pipe telling him that he was with the 15th, but not anymore. And is that gun supposed to scare him? There hasn't been bullets in this city for weeks. The thug pulls the trigger and shoots the ex-cop in the chest and smiles. But as he does, Cassandra jumps down from the rooftops, throwing a battering into the thug's hand and jumps in, kicking him in the face. Later, at the hospital, Cassandra brings in the man who was shot. Leslie looks him over, realizing that he was shot with a bullet. So Azrael states, is that so? Show me who. A 
few moments later back at the area where Cassandra found the ex-cop, she and Azrael see the thug and the thug says that she caught him off guard before, but this time. Cassandra walks up to him, kicking him in the face, bringing him back to the hospital. As Leslie is checking him out, Batman walks in. I gave you one job. Don't you think it's about time you started listening instead of playing around? Later, Azrael walks with Cassandra out of costume, stating that he's going to try and do this without hurting people. Every time he puts the Azrael suit on, something inside affects his body. He becomes really powerful and kind of mean. That's really the only part that he doesn't like about this. Without the suit, he's just Jean-Paul Valley, Pretty unmean guy. Word has it that Scratch has gatherings at the schoolyards, so they should start there. Maybe she could stand back and keep an eye out. But when Azrael looks back, Cassandra's already gone. That's when a large man steps out asking what he is doing here. So Azrael tells him that he heard that Mr. Scratch was given a talk he would like to. The man walks up to Azrael, looking him up and down, telling him to take a hike. Scratch don't want some guy like you in the crowd. The man stares for a moment and then is struck in the back of the head by Cassandra and Azrael tells her thanks. Once Azrael gets to the meeting, he sees a large group of people all waiting and shouting for their master to arrive. Just as the cheers get to their loudest, Scratch gets on stage telling everyone that he's heard the things that everyone has been saying and calling out. Dregs, the lost, the stupid, the criminal, and the insane, but he, he calls them the favored, the special, the chosen. They all know his history. He was a blob at his blobby job, but one night he was hit by a beam from a far away galaxy. It carried a message from beings far wiser than they and it instantly transformed him. He became rich, famous, and beloved. And all of that was only preparation because he knew that he was met for something grand. That's when an earthquake hit that level this place and he recognized it for what it was. A call to action. He had supplies, food, medicine, guns, and he waited. Waited until the time was right. And tomorrow at sunrise, they will go into the streets and they will slaughter all of those who turned them away. They will build upon the ruins a place of wealth and grandeur and unimaginable luxury. Azrael looks around at the crowd and just as he looks at the hundreds of mouths, they all say the same thing. Yes. That's when one of Scratch's men calls out to everyone to line up. They're going to be handing out their guns. Azrael patiently waits in line and when he's called, he notices something. The man handing out the guns is the same thug that Cassandra beat up earlier. The thug hands over the gun and then tells him, Wait a second, you look familiar. You're the guy that was wearing that funny suit! Everyone get him! Azrael runs and he begins to escape, but as he leaps over the wall, he's hit from behind and knocked to the ground. Scratch walks up telling him, I believe we've met before. Your name is Azrael. Or at least that's what you're calling yourself. Scratch brings Azrael on stage, telling everyone to line up and take turns shooting Azrael. Azrael leans up, telling him to just get it over with so that there's only one life lost. Scratch kneels down, asking, What do you mean by that? Wait, you wear a costume, that's it! If you die now, you'll just be another victim of no man's land. But if you die in costume in front of everyone, everyone will know that one of Batman's minions fell by my hand, Nicholas Scratch! Azrael's taunt worked, and he convinced Scratch to put him into his suit, which, unknown to him, is when Azrael is at his strongest. Scratch calls out that it's settled. Tomorrow they will march until a suitable group gathers, and then, then they will execute the costume. Until then, they'll have fun with their new friend here. So a short while later, the thug from before stands over Azrael's beaten body, telling him that it was fun. Afraid that's all he could do for now. Once the sun comes up, he'll die. And hopefully Scratch will let him be the one to do him in. Azrael laughs, telling him, <laughs> Take care! And once the coast is clear, Cassandra jumps down. Azrael asks where she's been. Are those the followers' guns? Good, good. She so reaches down, untying him, and Azrael tells her not to do it. She just needs to stay close, but make sure not to be seen. She'll know when she needs to come out. So the next morning, Azrael is put into his suit and he's brought out. But before the march can begin, one of the followers tells Scratch that someone stole all their guns. Scratch says that it's unfortunate. Well, just head down into the bunker and we'll get some more. Azrael listens and watches the man as he leaves to determine the direction of the bunker. The thug from before holds his gun to Azrael's head, asking, Did you do this? You couldn't have. You were tied up all night. I ate that pretty boy. Once the follower returns, the march begins as the thug is keeping his gun out, asking if he could shoot him yet. Scratch looks at the pile of bricks, telling him that he has a much better idea. They're going to stone Azrael to show everyone what happens when you oppose Nicholas Scratch. All of the followers begin to pick up bricks, but Azrael tells them to wait. You can't kill me without my mask. I wouldn't be complete. Scratch shouts, ah, thank you for the kind suggestion. Now get your mask. Once they put it on, Jean-Paul is no more, and all that's left is the persona of Azrael. 
Azrael tells him that this is going to be a warning. Surrender now, or he will most certainly hurt them all. Scratch laughs, telling him, I'm just going to take that chance. So Azrael holds up his bound hands and he smiles as he rips the ropes apart. Scratch yells to throw the bricks, but as the followers do, Azrael effortlessly blocks all of them. He then shouts to just use the guns, but that's when Cassandra jumps in, knocking everyone holding one down. The thug from before says, look, I was just doing as I was told. I ain't got no beef with, but before he could finish, Azrael knocks him out. Scratch then turns back to his followers, telling them to kill the sinner. But all of his followers turn and they walk away. With Azrael calling out to the masses, telling them that Scratch promised them salvation. He's calling him a liar. He is opposing him. Now do something, Scratch. Show them your strength. Scratch grabs one of the followers, demanding them to fight. But Azrael tells them, no, get on your knees and beg for mercy. Scratch then turns, lunging at Azrael, but using little of his strength, Azrael easily beats him down. Scratch stumbles back, telling him that the star beings promised me victory! So Azrael pulls back his fist and he smiles. They lied. With one last hook, Azrael knocks Scratch out. And so Azrael looks around at everyone, telling them that this is their savior. Anyone care to follow him now? The crowd disperses and Azrael tells Cassandra that they need to find those medical supplies. He has an idea where they're hidden. Later at the hospital, Azrael takes off his mask, telling Leslie that things got ugly. He didn't want to use violence, but that isn't the worst part. Him fighting like that, well, he enjoyed it. Leslie laughs, telling him that that just means that he learned that he isn't in control of himself. He's just like the rest of them. But the nice thing is, as long as they're still breathing, they can try again. Now come along. There are some sick people who need our help, Jean-Paul. And take off that ridiculous costume. With Azrael managing to take down Scratch, Batman begins his plan to take back over Blackgate with Nightwing. He explains that since Lockup took control, he's been ruling it with an iron fist, creating a living hell for all of those imprisoned there. But there's no way he's doing it alone. He must have help. He must likely be using some of the convicts to keep the others in line. Almost feel sorry for anyone who has to go in there. Nightwing sits with Batman, looking over the prison, asking if he wants to go inside of Blackgate. Batman tells him that Lockup has served his purpose, but since he's been collecting some of the worst criminals in no man's land, he might just realize that he has an army imprisoned in there. Nightwing says that he's got his own city to worry about, you know. Bloodhaven hasn't gotten any nicer since a million Gotham Knights have been camping out there. Batman tells him that once Gotham is cleaned up, they can come back. But Nightwing stops him, yelling, do not give me the whole bigger picture storyline. I already have to break into a prison full of murderous psychopaths to take control back from a renegade control freak. No need to sugarcoat things. Barbara then radios in that she's got a match for someone that he can pose as to sneak in. Clyde Greenlaw. They share a similar weight and height. Nightwing looks at the picture asking if he can really pass as this guy and Barbara tells him, not to his mother maybe, but it's not like lockup is really keeping records. So a short while later at the prison, Clyde mops the floor while one of the Trigger twins calls out to him that he missed a spot. Clyde tells him, Come on! See him ghost boss? Making a mess of my floor. Ought to fix the roof so they can't fly in. The twins laugh, telling him, Sure. They'll fix the hole in the roof after they get some hot tubs and lace curtains. As night begins to fall on the land, Nightwing sneaks in through the roof, noticing something. All the cells here are empty. Nightwing then makes his way to Clyde's cell and he grabs him by the mouth, telling him that he's going to need him to be quiet for a bit. Can we talk? Clyde muffles while nodding his head and Nightwing tells him good. They're going to talk about his future. He's going to leave this place, no questions asked. Would he like that? Clyde muffles and nods again. But as Nightwing lets go, Clyde runs out shouting, No! I won't go back to Gotham! Don't let him take my back, please! Nightwing was to follow, thinking that was not what he was expecting. But before he could think on it too long, the Trigger Twins run out, opening fire. Nightwing jumps over the ledge and Tom yells, woo That one's a scrapper. So Nightwing lands on the bottom floor, running down a hallway, and as he turns the corner, KG Beast appears, asking, Have we met? The Beast swings and Nightwing throws his batons, forcing Beast to deflect while sliding under the giant body to escape. But before he could get far, the Trigger Twins rush down and they begin to shoot once again. Nightwing ducks behind a wall to get cover, but Beast steps out of the shadows, telling him, Looks like you're returning to me. Beast tries to stab again, but as he does, Nightwing ducks, grabbing him by the arm, slamming him into a wall, and then he throws Beast over his shoulder and into the Trigger Twins. Nightwing then takes a moment to admire his own work, but suddenly he's shocked from behind. And Lockup looks down, telling him, Seems we have ourselves a new inmate. 
Once the others are up, Tad reaches down, stating that they should take the mask off. But Lockup tells him that it doesn't matter who he is. In a few minutes, he'll be dead. Frisk him for weapons and toss him in the hole. He should have a warm welcome down there. So a short while later, Nightwing begins to hear voices. And then shapes. People begin to surround Nightwing, telling him that they should kill him. But when Nightwing can fully see, Scarecrow tells everyone to back off. Linz points his shiv at Nightwing, yelling, No! We're gonna disembowel the hero! All the villains locked up at the start are trying to get at Nightwing, but Scarecrow shouts for them to stop! They don't know what they're doing! Nightwing jumps up to the grate that he was thrown in from, but before he can squeeze through the holes, KG Beast sprays him with water, knocking him back to the ground. Before the villains can go back to fighting, Scarecrow then stands up between them, yelling, We gotta think about this. If Nightwing is here, what does that mean? It would mean that there's been a falling out between Lockup and the Bat. It also means that the Bat will be coming here looking for Nightwing. We have a bargaining chip! A voice then says, Dr. Crane is right. For once, put reason ahead of your lust for revenge, Linz. Linz yells back at Black Mask as he walks out, stating that he needs to stay out of it. As the two argue, Nightwing steps back, stating that Batman is not coming, and he is getting out of here. A brawl erupts between the convicts, but it's Sako who brings up Reason, stating that they need to stop and listen to Nightwing. They can always kill him after they escape, so why not use him to their advantage? Everyone stop, and Lin says, fine. But if Nightwing is yanking our chains, I got dibs on his face. A short while later, Lockup returns asking to speak with Nightwing. One of the convicts says it's going to be a little difficult. He's dead. Lockup asks who did it, and the convict points back, stating that it was Steel Jacket. There's nothing left of him. That Steel Jacket also kind of ate him. The convict then holds up a skull, telling him that that's all that's left, with Lockup shouting, You're animals! But as he leaves, Scarecrow asks, So what's the plan? Nightwing tells him that he wasn't expecting all of them to be holed up here. What exactly are they doing here anyway? Scarecrow explains, Blackgate was a Civil War gun battery for protection from Gotham Harbor. Sako yells, Yeah! and we're stuck in the powder magazine where they stored the shot for the cannons. The walls are 10 feet thick! Nightwing then looks at the stock of cannonballs, stating, yeah, this place still stinks of sulfur. He then drags his finger along the gaps between the bricks, stating that this place is full of residue from the gunpowder. There must be a hundred pounds of this stuff embedded in the walls, and you know what that means. Well, while the convicts begin to collect that gunpowder, outside, Lockup says that he's made up his mind and there's nothing that's going to change it. Beast tells him, Seems kind of dramatic. And Lockup goes on telling him, It's a question of resources. We have new inmates coming in every day. They use up all of our food supplies and electricity. We have to reduce the population to make room for more. And there's only one way to do that. As Lockup and Beast begin to turn the lever on the pump, back in the hole, Scarecrow calls out that they seem to have a leak somewhere. Nightwing says that that's seawater, and Sako shouts, They're gonna drown us like rats! As the floodgates open, Lockup heads back inside, listening to everyone scream, and he simply says, Listen to that. They're screaming in fear! Nightwing then shouts for everyone to bring the explosives to the wall. Once the pouches are set, Nightwing lights the fuse and tells everyone to take cover. Everyone waits for a few seconds, and then there's a loud BOOM as the wall is blown open. As the walls crumble, releasing the water, Nightwing jumps from the hanging chains, followed by someone else. As the convicts get close to the exit, Nightwing turns back, cutting those chains, with Linz yelling, I knew it! I'm gonna cut that pretty face clean off. With Nightwing distracted, he's kicked in the face, and Beast climbs down, telling them all, It's so nice not to see you dead. He begins to swing his metal arm around, cutting more chains, but Nightwing runs along the wall, throwing his entire body into Beast, slamming his face in the wall. As Beast falls, knocking everyone else down, Nightwing climbs out of the sewer drain and the Trigger Twins begin to try and shoot at him with more gunfire. Nightwing quickly jumps behind the boxes as Lockup runs up asking where did he go. Lockup then looks down the hole, telling the Twins to go after him. I'll watch after the... But that's when there's a rumble and Nightwing drives a forklift into a stack of boxes, knocking the entire pile down onto Lockup and the Twins. Batman's crew then moves in to take control now that Lockup is out of the picture back over at the clock tower. Lightning strikes as Barbara hears something scratching at the window. She looks over to see Nightwing beaten and bruised, but he tells her that he found a blind spot in her security. Better look into it, Babs. As he finishes, he collapses to the floor. As Nightwing recovers from his mission to Blackgate, Barbara works away at her computer stating that it would seem the Penguin is somehow involved in an agreement with Ivy for fruit. They could ask Penguin why, but Batman tells her, No, anything else. 
Barbara says, well, then one of her agents reported about the kids being seen in Ivy's Park. Could be playing, could be staying there, no one knows for sure. Batman thinks about it and says that, I'll look at it with Robin later. But first, a short while later at Penguin's suit, one of his many women redresses the bandage on his leg when there's a sudden crash. One of Penguin's guards run in shouting, Batman's here! And Penguin says, yes, yes, I can hear that. Let him in already. The guard says, very good. But then he's knocked down as Batman kicks his way through the door. Penguin sighs, great, just the person I didn't want to see. Batman picks up a fruit, telling him, this is a royal Cree pear, considered the finest in the world. Penguin tells him, you know me, only the best. And Batman tells him, it's out of season, unique to Eastern Europe, with the exception of a single Cree tree in Robinson Park. Batman then picks up Penguin by the rope, telling him, I've heard she's using kids. As Batman releases, Penguin tells him, Not to my knowledge. Clayface arranged the whole thing. Ivy grows the fruits. Clayface distributes. That's all I know. Batman then asks, What's in it for Clayface? And Penguin tells him, Money! An account in Grand Cayman has been growing for the last several months. Later that night, outside of Robinson Park, Robin asks, Why are we here? And Batman tells him, For Gotham's insurance. The two quietly sneak in, and as they go, branches and vines begin to shift, showing them a path. When they come to an opening of statues, Batman lights a small stick of dynamite and places it into the mouth of one of those statues. When it goes off, there's a clicking sound, and the statue begins to move back. Robin follows Batman as he jumps down and asks, Did you know this was here? And Batman turns the lights on, telling him, I was the one who built it. While I was gone and Dick took over, I had caves constructed all across the city. As Batman opens up the door, he sees Ivy encased in clay with shackles on a group of children. She looks up, stating that she knew that he would come. She just hopes that he's not too late. Robin hurries down to help free the children, and Batman tells Ivy to explain, FAST! Ivy says that these children were abandoned on Black Monday. She cared for them. Batman grits his teeth, asking, WHAT HAPPENED? WHY ARE YOU USING CHILDREN FOR YOUR WORK? And Ivy tells him, Clayface. He captured the kids and he put them here and told her to grow whatever he says and make the children harvest the crops. He keeps her weak, not enough sun, barely enough water, and he feeds her salt. Does he have any idea what salt does to a plant? As Batman looks at the ground, Ivy goes on telling him, I found this place before Clayface arrived. His place, an honest-to-goodness bat cave, complete with all sorts of neat things, computers, equipment, plastic, poisonous little boy toys, and then this. She holds out a small sealed box telling him, this though, she couldn't get into what's inside. Batman tells her, enough, what do you want it for? Ivy covers the box of vines telling him to free them, help her destroy Clayface, leave this park, save the children, and she'll never return. After that, he can have whatever this box contains, and she promises. Batman looks at the children telling her, I can't leave them with you. And Ivy asks, why not? Who else is going to take care of them? You? You're running out of time. I can feel every footstep on the grass above. Clayface will be back by dawn. Batman pauses to think and he tells Robin, get the kids to safety. And Robin asks, what are you going to do? So Batman tells him, I'm going to get some mud on my boots. Once everyone leaves, Ivy tells him that they're alone at last, and Batman begins to hit the clay, trying to break it free, and Ivy says that the kids have already tried that. So after a few more hits, Batman stops and says, I fought Clayface just after the earthquake. He's too powerful for me to take on alone, but I have a plan. You'll have to help me and do exactly as I say, so tell me, what do you need to be strong again? Ivy asks, what does any plant need? Once the kids are out of the park and safe, Robin gets a message from Batman telling him, I have a job for you. And so when the sun comes out, Robin goes into one of the many statues and presses a hidden button under the display. A panel shifts open and Robin reaches and taking out the contents, stating, this is some heavy duty explosives. A short while later, Clayface returned. And when he doesn't see the children, he asks, what's going on? Where's my little slave labor force? Ivy doesn't answer, and Clayface grabs her by the face, telling her, If you don't answer me, I will salt your earth until you scream. Batman shouts at him, telling him, Get your hands off her! And Clayface turns back, telling him, I was hoping the bat would stop by. Like what I've done with the place? Batman swings the pipe, telling him, Not really. But Clayface extends one of his arms, grabbing Batman by the leg, with Ivy screaming to let him go. Clayface laughs, shouting, Aw, sounds like she likes you. Hang on a sec, we're gonna build up a charge so that I can. 
Batman slams the pipe into Clayface's back, releasing the charge that he was building, telling him, You talk too much. As Clayface lets go, Batman radios to Robin, telling him to hit it, and a second later, explosions go off above ground, flooding the cave with water and sunlight. As Batman and Clayface rise out of the flooding waters, Ivy stands there telling everyone, All right, boys, let's finish this. Clayface bursts out laughing, finish it, baby, we're just getting started. Ivy tells him that it's been six months, six months since he trapped her, abused her, tortured her, defiled her, polluted her, enslaved the children that she swore to protect, enslaved her, abused the green, and now you're going to pay, Clayface. Batman slams down a small cartridge of nitrogen, freezing Clayface's hand, and as it breaks off, Ivy calls down a vine from the top. Batman jumps onto it while grabbing onto Ivy and flings the both of them outside while telling Robin to throw in a second charge. Robin tosses in a small package as Clayface shouts, I will kill you all! But before he can finish, the charge goes off with a loud faroom! Clayface starts to pull himself out of the ground, yelling, You can't blow me up! You're not going to stop me! He gets ready to lunge, but as he does, he feels something. Something pulling at him. A nearby tree grabs onto him, and soon Clayface begins to scream out in pain. Roots begin to grow out of his body, and Ivy asks if he can feel it. You're very good soil full of nutrients and minerals. You're creating life. You're feeding all those plants growing inside of you right now, and we're going to use you just like you tried to do with me and the children. As the green slowly covers his body, Batman shouts, That's enough! I won't let you kill him! And then the vines reach out, holding Batman back, and Ivy tells him, You weren't the one trapped by that monster for six months! Keep out of this, Bats! Batman struggles to free himself, but Ivy walks over to Clayface, leaning down, asking, How would you like a kiss? Clayface tells her, Please! Don't! And Ivy says that she remembers asking the same of him. She leans in and kisses him, and as she pulls back, Clayface smiles and crumbles away. The vines loosen their grip on Batman, and Ivy asks, Do you know what day it is? It's the first day of summer. A few moments later, Ivy returns to the box that Batman came for, stating that she hopes that he's not too disappointed. He opens it up, and after looking inside, he dumps a bunch of damaged discs, stating that she destroyed them. Ivy says of course she did. She found the box before Clayface arrived, and she knew that it was his and they were plastic. Petroleum byproducts are poisoning to plants. Besides, she's pretty sure that he has backup files somewhere. Batman thinks for a moment and then says, Here's the deal. You keep the park, keep the order. Don't let anyone, Two-Face, Penguin, Freeze, any of them, take the park. You care for the children. Tuesdays and Fridays, you'll release produce to the city. Leave it at the south gate. Grow only what we'll need. Do these things and I will leave you alone. So later that night, back at the clock tower, Barbara looks at the computer stating that they only have one option here. They need to contact her. The whole plan with Poison Ivy didn't work since he destroyed Batman's backups. And Batman groans. It's not that simple. We're going to have to trick her into doing what we need. Over in Manhattan, the phone of Catwoman rings and she picks it up with a voice telling her that it's Rizzo. Catwoman tells Rizzo that she said never call her, but Rizzo says that she told him only to call her if he sees something interesting on display. While there's a cat-headed gem that makes the Hope Diamond look like a hunk of charcoal. After her mission, the next day at Robinson Central Station, Catwoman walks through the ruined building stating, Hello? Batman, I got your message. Came a long way. Batman jumps out of the shadows telling her that he is in need of a thief. That there are some computer disks that contain vital data for restoring Gotham. Catwoman asks, why not get them yourself? And Batman tells her, they're in Manhattan. She stops and laughs and then lunges at Batman shouting that she just got here from Manhattan and he wants her to go back? She's gonna kill him for that! Batman dodges, stating that he couldn't risk anyone else learning about the discs. He's sorry for tricking her about the gem, but he needed to know that she could get into Gotham. She cracks her whip, asking, Why should I do anything for you? And he holds out his arm, taking the lash, and then pulls Catwoman close, stating, I need you. And he kisses her. She blushes for a moment and asks, What else? As Batman goes out on patrol, he notices something coming out of Chinatown. Across the dark Gotham, he sees bright neon lights where there should only be candlelight and open flames. As he gets down there, he sees a group of men frozen in place, hauling a trailer full of furniture. This could only be the work of Mr. Freeze, but these men, they have the tags of the Jade Leopards. Wrong gang for this street. This is Ghost Dragon Turf. And why furniture? 
as Free's cornering the market on Asian antiques. But before Batman could think any further on the case, a group of ghost dragon thugs appear telling him that he's in the wrong part of town, Kate man. You should get lost before you get hurt. Batman says that he doesn't see anything that could possibly hurt him. One of the men charges forward with a chain and sickle, but Batman grabs the chain, wrapping it around the man's neck. He kicks the man with the knife and he knees the first thug in the face. The third man has nunchucks and he lunges at Batman, who takes the sickle, cutting the chain on the nunchucks, throwing them to the side. The last man runs in with a pair of scythes, but Batman swings the sickle back, disarming him. The man falls back, begging him to not kill him, and Batman tells him, I don't kill, but you will tell me why Freeze is involved with Chinatown disputes. The man then says that they supply Freeze with stuff to burn, and in turn, Freeze gives them a cable to run for power. The leopards have been trying to cut into their action, and well, this is what happened. So Batman asks, where is Freeze now? The man points off in the distance towards a giant ice castle next to a running power plant, telling him that he is there. So a short while later at the loading dock for the power plant, Freeze's thugs toss more furniture into the furnace when their next supply rings in. They begin to start unloading and Batman jumps out of one of the closets, taking the men down. Up the tower, Freeze looks out telling himself that there is so much evil and anger out there. This is the destruction of the infrastructure. He is stripping Gotham down to its bare bones. This is the pillaging of the city that the accursed Batman holds so dear. Soon, everything he cares about will be brought down and degraded. Batman will see anarchy reign where the rule of law once held sway. Batman, he never understood his reason for becoming Mr. Freeze. He just wanted to save his beloved Nora. He froze her in hopes that she would thaw once a cure was found for her disease. But the meddling Batman ruined it. Because of him, Nora was taken away and shattered before his very eyes. He swears to her that he shall get his revenge against the Batman. Batman then asks, Is that what Nora would have really wanted? By all accounts, Nora was a kind and gentle loving person. Is this any way to memorialize her? Freeze grabs his freeze ray shouting, There's only one thing that can block my pain. Sweet vengeance. He fires a freeze blast at Batman, but as he dodges, Batman tells him, Revenge is not sweet. It is a bitter pill, and that pill is erosive. It eats away at your soul. Are you forgetting that you're the one who shattered the frozen body of Nora? Freeze yells that it was because of him that it happened. He put himself into that position so that Nora would get shattered during their fight. Freeze begins to close in on Batman, and he sees Batman grabbing something from his pouch, throwing it to the side. Batman throws the battering, telling him, These things always have a way of coming back, though. And the battering whips back, knocking the freeze ray out of Freeze's hands. He jumps up, grabbing the ray gun, asking, Did you really think that it would end like this? You've never fought a foe as clever as I am. And Freeze creates a slide going down that he shoots himself back up and starts to freeze Batman in place. Freeze then tells him that in just a few seconds, ice crystals will form in the soft tissues, making the defrosting process extremely painful, if not fatal. As Freeze begins to laugh, there's a rumble and a loud crack as the castle begins to break apart. And Freeze asks what's going on. And that's when the workers down at the power plant radio stating that it was Batman. He stoked the fires and the burners and he opened up all of the valves. The second worker yells that there's nothing that they can do. They need to get out of here before the entire place explodes. The furnaces all begin to start exploding, shooting fire everywhere, and Freeze shouts, stating that Batman sabotaged the power plant before he came up here. Batman breaks out of his half-melted frozen prison, stating, That's right. As every chess player knows, it doesn't matter how clever you are if you can think five moves ahead. He tackles into Freeze, but Freeze grabs him, getting ready to throw him off the balcony. But before he can, the floor cracks and the two begin to fall down towards the fires. They land on a thin bridge and they immediately go after one another, kicking and punching over and over again. But then there's another explosion, taking out the rest of the power plant and Freeze's castle. Batman dives headfirst into the water below, asking Freeze if he could seeds yet. Freeze shouts, NEVER! And he hits the water and the two quickly swim towards land. Batman pulls himself up onto the docks of Freeze yelling that, I will not be made a prisoner. I will return. And Freeze floats away in a chunk of ice with Batman staring at him, telling him, I'm waiting for your return. The sounds of the last Skinner being knocked out echo through the silent night as Batman twists the knife from the man's hand. As things go quiet, once again, Batman looks around at all of the men hanging from the ceiling, telling himself that these men are lucky that he came when he did. 
and one of those men begins to wiggle around, yelling, Hurry! It cut me loose! Blood's rushing to my head! But Batman doesn't hurry. He knows who that man is. Henry Streeter. Henry is a British national wanted for global computer crimes. He came to run a sting on Gotham's stock market the day before the quake. Bad timing for him. Batman reaches up to untie Henry, and Henry tells him that he has to hurry. It looks like someone is flashing the light before finishing the last knot. Batman leaves for the bat signal, and Henry yells, asking, Where are you going? With a quick flick of his wrist, a small battering soars through the air, cutting the rope that is suspending Henry. Henry comes crashing down, and Batman tells him that he'll be back. Don't be here when he is. A few moments later, Batman pulls the cloth draped over a series of salvaged headlights, stating that their set is rather clever. Now explain. The priest and the young girl turn back and the girl yells, He came! He really came! The king! The king of Gotham! The priest says that he knows what this looks like. They need help. But it would be easier if he'd explained downstairs. So Batman tells the priest that he heard of the king. An urban legend that sprung out of a chaotic nightmare that Gotham has become. The modern day Robin Hood, helping the weak and feeding the poor. A shred of hope and decency in a world of anarchy. The priest says that the king isn't just a fable. He's real and he has helped them. The king has provided them with a rehydration powder to bring some of them back from the brink of death. Then taught them how to make water filters using just sand, gravel, and charcoal. Batman asks, What is it you need then? Has the king disappeared? And the priest says that the king left him a makeshift bat signal in case he didn't return. So Batman sets back out looking for the mysterious King of Gotham with what very little information he has. You see, there is a king in Gotham and no one has ever seen his face, but his teachings have spread far and wide throughout the wasteland. Batman stops in one of the known water traders in the city to find their operation ransacked and the men killed. And upon investigating one of the deceased, Batman sees scales under one of the men's fingernails. And that scale could only belong to one man. Across the city, at the mall ruins, a man is beaten as Killer Croc shouts, telling the man to say it again. The man says that Killer Croc is the King of Gotham, your highness. Croc grabs the man, shaking him, asking, Do you know how many skulls I had to crush to find you? And the man struggles, telling him, Too many! So Croc throws him, asking, Who said you could talk? One of Croc's thugs asks if they should really be hurting the guy. The dude's worth his weight in gold, the magic he could work. Croc then spins back, grabbing that thug by the head, squeezing it until there's a blood curdling. Croc! Croc then turns back to the others, asking if anyone else feels like speaking up. As everyone shakes their heads no, Batman rolls in a concussion grenade to blind everyone and make short work of the thugs. Croc then lunges, grabbing Batman from behind, telling him, Now this is more like it! Batman whips his head back, breaking Croc's nose, and the two begin to exchange blows. Before Batman can get the upper hand, Croc swipes his claws, ripping into Batman's chest, causing him to fall over. Croc leaps into the air to deliver the final blow, but Batman catches Croc by his feet, launching through the wall into the parking lot below. As Batman gets back up, the King says that he's got some moves. Have you come to bust up Croc? Or me? Batman gets up staring at the man, asking, Stanley Dembski, you're the king? Stanley sets up telling him, I didn't pick that name. Some kid said it and well, it's stuck. Kinda like it though. Well, until recently when Croc was trying to take it. Batman asks him, what's your angle? You're a career criminal. Why the Good Samaritan acts? Stanley tells him, I got old, that's what. I spent so much of my life in Blackgate, I figured I'd give back. Teach people some new skills and trades, make a little money. But this place, it's dog eat dog and then some. I had no idea that it was getting so bad. After meeting the priest and them kids, well, I wanted to do more. Does that sound nuts, Batman? Batman tells him, no, it doesn't. So a short while later, Batman helps Stanley back into the priest's sanctuary, telling them that his name is Stanley Dembski and he's a friend. It started at 11.45 at night. Jimmy and his jets try to knock over some old man Sanchez in his gas station. Sanchez does well defending himself at first, but one of Jimmy's goons cracks Sanchez from behind the chain, and it's all over. But lucky for Sanchez, the boots of Cassandra Kane set down and everyone stops what they're doing. Everyone stares at Cassandra, who now wears the Batgirl costume, and, well, they burst out laughing. One of the goons tells the others to get a load of this! A little orphan ninja! <laughs> and Jimmy and the Jets have now underestimated her. And she thinks good, because that'll make things easier. Cassandra leaps into the air, knocking each one of the thugs out one 
by one. A chop to the neck, a boot to the face, a palm to the chin, and a pinch to the throat. Jimmy drops his knife as Cassandra Kane continues to squeeze. She likes it. Likes it too much. She must stop. Stop. Right now. The message has been delivered. The territory is hers. Sanchez jumps up to his feet shouting that that's right. Who's laughing now, you bums? And once the scene is clear, Sanchez brings Cassandra into the gas station and she sends word that the target is secured. All that's left is to send the prearranged command code and wait. Over at the clock tower, Batman receives the command that Cassandra has taken over the gas station. Nightwing tells her that that's good. They can move out now, and Batman tells him no. Joker's forces have now taken the west side. There's too much activity on the northeast corridor. They're going to need to wait till dawn. So Nightwing asks if they're really going to leave Cassandra out there. It'll be a long night for the girl. And Batman tells him, yes, it will be, but she can do the job. See, earlier that night, Batman and the others were looking for a way to secure gas for the generators at the hospital. Problem was, gas is tapped from the tower to Midtown. And that's why Cassandra motioned that she wanted to help, pointing at the map of the city. Batman looks at where she's pointing, telling her, I'm using Mile. It's a war zone between here and there. I can't send you up there alone. Cassandra grabs Batman, pleading with him. And after careful consideration, Batman agrees. She'll go and secure the area, and once things are clear, she will send out a call to retrieve the gas. She will not leave the target area, and will not, under any circumstances, let anyone die. So, Cassandra waits. And she waits. And she waits. Sanchez washes the windows, talking about how things used to be. How he knew Jimmy and the others when they were kids. But his talking is distracting. She was there to secure the area, not make idle chat. She climbs up to one of the nearby buildings to get a lay of the land, learn its sounds, its smells, its rhythms, the places where it's fortified and where it's vulnerable. Make it hers. And that's when she hears the voices. Down in the alleyway, one of Jimmy's goons says that he's not sure about this one. It's just a gas station, right? It'll explode if they shoot it with a rocket launcher. Jimmy sets up the old style rocket launcher on its metal stand, telling him that the penguin said it was the last one. Gotta prove a point. The others continue to question Jimmy's decision, but then another voice says that it's because Jimmy is scared of the girl. Jimmy turns back, yelling at Django to shut up, but one of the goons says that Django took karate, right? He was a black belt in school, weren't you, Django? Django steps out of the shadows with his cigarette, telling them all that he was. As he gets closer, the men begin to talk softly to make sure that no one else can hear their plan. And so a little while later, Jimmy returns to the gas station, calling out to Sanchez that he's got something for him and his little girlfriend. Sanchez runs out, shouting that he doesn't have time for, and Jimmy stops him. What's wrong? Oh, the rocket launcher? Yeah, that's how things are going to go down. You're either going to give me the gas station or we're going to blow it up. Sanchez tells him that they're going to have to shoot through him first. So Jimmy then tells one of the thugs to fill up the gas can. The ninja girl isn't around, so there's no stopping them. As the thugs get closer, Sanchez, well, he smiles. Jimmy asks what gives, and that's when Cassandra jumps in, kicking the thug off of the rocket launcher. She holds the man down, kicking and taking out the others, not breaking eye contact with Jimmy. And once she's done, well, she cracks Jimmy one. Django rushes in with a broken bottle, but Cassandra can tell that this is going to be easy. She can smell the cigarette smoke off of him. He's most likely out of shape. Jimmy yells to one of the thugs to stop wasting time, fill the can, and when he gets there, he only gets a few single drops. You see everyone stares, and Sanchez stands there smiling, stating that they haven't had any gas for about three weeks now. All of this has been for nothing. Jimmy jumps to his feet, shouting, Bull! You have a stash of gas somewhere! Spill it or the gas station is gone! And Sanchez tries to tell them again that there really isn't any, so Jimmy pulls the trigger. Cassandra quickly runs through, grabbing both Sanchez and the thug and moving them out of the way of the RPG. Seconds later, there's a kaboom! As the gas station is blown to pieces. Cassandra charges in, kicking Jimmy, beating him to the ground when Sanchez tells her to stop. He knows that she's angry, but she can't sink to their level. If she stomps his face in now, she'll lose something more important. Her principles. Don't turn into another animal and don't stop caring. Cassandra pauses and she walks away. Batman steps out of the shadows, telling her that she followed orders. Good job, soldier. And as it turns out, Sanchez did have a stash of gas hidden in the hot dog stand down the street. With that, the generators of the hospital can keep running for another two weeks, and the injured were taken to the MASH unit and treated in time past. Broken bones healed, things will never be the same. After the quake hit Gotham, many people inside trying to escape the Savage Land, but some 
Some wanted to get in. Bane was outside of the city when the buildings fell, and right now it's the perfect time to claim what belongs to him. Bane has no problem with delayed gratification. In fact, waiting is something that he is very familiar with. While others saw Gotham as a city in ruins, Bane saw La Penaduro in Santa Prisca, the prison in which he was born and raised in. To him, this new Gotham, this was home. As Bane pushes the button on his remote, a speeding car carrier heads straight for the hole on the channel bridge that is separating Gotham from the mainland. The police on patrol there try to stop the truck by shooting out its tires when suddenly the truck stops before going over the edge. The police open up the door and they see that there is nobody inside, only a radio controlled device hooked up to the gas pedal. This is what Bane wanted. This is what Bane planned for. He grips the steering wheel to the van that he's waiting in and he aims for the ramp on the car carrier. As the van soars through the air, Bane thinks back to when he was in Blackgate. There was a prisoner by the name of Axel. As Axel had tried to assert his dominance by ambushing Bane in the laundry room, it wasn't Bane who was ambushed. It was Axel. Bane stood over Axel, who had failed at his job, asking, Who are you? And Axel told him that he was king. Bane focuses, flexing his muscles, telling him that he was king. And now he shall be king again. The van comes crashing down on the other side of the bridge, and the lowlifes quickly surround him. One man opens up the door, but Bane is already gone, escaped out the back. Then the man sees Bane swinging from the steel beams underneath the bridge headed towards Gotham. He calls out to the others, and then sees that Bane has left a bundle of dynamite under the van. The explosion catches the attention of Batman, who within moments arrives on the scene, and one of the men weakly states that it was Bane. He went down into the tower pier. Batman quickly follows the trail of bodies on his way to the pier, and then he notices the sewage area, and he sees a film on the water that is yet to be disturbed, which means... But before Batman could finish his sentence, the giant fist of Bane swings through the air, punching Batman right in the jaw. The force of the hit knocks Batman onto his back, and just as Bane gets ready to stomp onto his head, Batman catches it. The two go back and forth, hitting each other until Bane takes out a stick of dynamite, tossing it down a pipe. A second later, another explosion goes off flooding the passage. Batman crawls out of one of the manholes when he sees a nun standing there and he asks, Which way did he? But the nun says, The brute of the man in the mask? He came out of the other manhole and he went into the old prop warehouse. Batman hurries over stating that this is a strange place for a showdown. This venue is more appropriate to the Joker. Bane stands there telling him, The joke is on you. I broke you once before, and I will break you again. I am going to be king. It is my destiny. Batman runs in, tackling Bane, but Bane easily lifts him up, throwing him into a stack of boxes. Bane charges in, punching Batman, stating that he was in the throes of Venom. It owned him. It empowered him. But he won over it. If he can beat Venom, he can beat Batman. As Bane slams Batman's head into the cold cement floor, Batman kicks back shouting, WRONG! You may have kicked Venom, but Venom is what gave you your superhuman strength. Without it, you're just another loser like the rest. Another loser who's going down. Batman lands a few punches, but as Bane stumbles back, he says, I will offer an ethical choice. We can continue this battle and gamble on what may come out of it. Or you could defuse the dynamite bomb that I planted in the sewer beneath the nun's soup kitchen. There's about 20 seconds left, maybe less. With no other choice, Batman rushes back to the sewer. And then Bane walks out of the warehouse into the alley, telling himself, It is a beautiful day to start a new. But that's when some local thugs call out that someone just walked into their turf. Where does he think that he's going? Bane turns back, telling him, I am king here, and I am home. A little time passes, and a group of thugs take out their knives and guns, telling an unexpected traveler that he walked down the wrong alleyway. And there's no way that he can take them all out. Bane grabs one of the thugs, telling them, No, not all. I just need one of you alive. But only one. I am Bane! The female thug tells him that she knows who he is. He used to run Gotham. But the key word is used to. She pulls out a knife, and Bane grabs her by the arm, telling her, Do not try my patience! You being alive is not based on your gender. You just offered the least threat, now come. 
He takes out a small device, and after pressing a few buttons, a hidden passage opens up, and the girl asks where did it come from. Bane tells her that in all of their time occupying this building, they never thought to look under their feet. He pushes the girl down the stairs, and as she stumbles over the bones of dozens of dead bodies, Bane says that this passage has numerous traps. She will be his Judas goat. The girl carefully steps on the bones when suddenly there's a click. A gun springs out attempting to shoot but fires nothing. And Bane says that it would seem the gun is out of ammo. Our skeletal friends there took the teeth from this trap. As the two reach the bottom, Bane takes out the device and the girl asks what is in the safe here? Money? Food? Bane tells her no. Something far more valuable. The man who owns this has this place far beneath the streets. And he's a man prepared for any tomorrow. He is a man who wants to own all of Gotham, though his name is unknown. Bane walks into the giant vault and returns holding a large minigun, and the girl asks, what does he plan on doing with that? He says that he will spend it in meaningful carnage. And once outside, the girl drags a large steel case, stating that whatever is in here is heavy. Bane stops and asks, perhaps I should have spared one of your more brawnier compadres. The girl sighs, stating that maybe they should have, and Bane motions to continue. As they begin their trek again, a voice calls out. Hey, Duto! You think you can just cruise through here without paying the toll? Soon, the whirl of the minigun winds up, and all that can be heard is it firing as Bane is holding down the trigger. The girl quickly ducks out of the way as the raiders all fall, and she yells, asking, Are you crazy? What are you doing? He tells her that he is multiplying his efforts. He is spreading the terror. And now it's time to leave the calling card. A short while later, outside of Two Faces had already is woken up by the sounds of gunfire. He crawls out of bed asking, Can't a guy get a couple of Z's around here? One of his guards running yelling that the street demons are outside. If they had themselves a truce, it's over now. Two Face grabs his rifle, shouting at the attackers, You will die for this. You'll be begging for a second chance, you double-crossing mutts! Soon after, Bane calls his employer, telling him that all is going according to plan, and the voice on the other side of the phone tells him that this is a fine game that they play, and it's all lost in the details. Be sure to stay in touch. As Bane ends the call, the girl asks if that was his boss. And Bane says that, I allow it for the illusion, for now. But the prize I will win, I will win for myself. Now come! The girl goes back to dragging the large steel case, asking, What's the point? Why are you getting everyone mad at each other? And Bane tells her that he's not getting everyone mad at each other, only mad at one man. And over at Two-Face's hideout, a group of street demons calls out to Two-Face to hurry and get his ugly half a butt out of here. Two-Face shouts, asking, Why don't you guys just come inside? I'll take you out two at a time! <laughs> But elsewhere, while all the gangs are focused on Two-Face, Bane scopes out a building and the girl asks, what is it? The library? And Bane tells her that it's the Hall of Records. It holds all the city's ugliest memories and minor details. The girl then asks, what is he going to do? Rob it? And he tells her, no, he's going to level it. No stone shall stand upon another. Bane stands up with his minigun, spraying down the lax security set by Two-Face. And he soon runs out of ammo. The girl asks if this is the part where they get out of here, and Bane tells her, No, you will stay here and do not make me go hunting for you later. As he takes out a fistful of grenades, the girl hides behind a rock, stating, Please let him get killed. Please let him get killed. But after the loud explosion, the girl isn't so fortunate as Bane steps back up and everyone else stays down. Across the way, though, Batman and Tim Drake are watching. Tim begins to plan out their attack, and Batman tells him that they will leave Bane alone. Tim asks why. That's the Hall of Records. That's Gotham's archives. Batman tells him, I will give you a reason. Two, in fact. Back at the other battle, the street demons capture Two-Face, telling him, You are being charged with the murder of our brothers. How do you plead? And Two-Face tells them, Guilty as charged. All the street demons start to chant, Hang him! Hang him! And the leader of the gang tells everyone, Shut up! We're going to let chance decide at the flip of a coin. Heads we win, tails Two-Face loses. The coin is flipped and suddenly there's a pling as the coin is knocked away. And everyone turns around to see Batman kicking one of the thugs into the group yelling, Case just missed. So Tim jumps onto the lamppost that Two-Face is hung up on asking, How does it end to be in the other end of the rope there, Harf? Batman calls out to cut Two-Face loose and Tim sighs, Fine. And back over at the Hall of Records, the girl opens up the steel case asking, What's in here anyway? They like super bombs or something? Bane takes the canister from her, telling her, They are nuclear bombs. A low-yield weapon, more compact than dynamite. With an added deterrence of radiation. 
Rome did more than just level the cities of her enemies. They salted the earth so that nothing could grow there. Soon, Gotham City's memories will be reduced to ash and we will poison the ground beneath them. The girl asks how much time do they have and Bane tells her, 10 minutes. The two run back outside and as they clear the building, the nukes go off. The explosions shaking all of Gotham to its core and everyone can feel the effects. As the smoke clears, Bane and the girl get up and Bane says, That destruction is total. You are now free to go. The girl asks, is that it? She's free? And Bane tells her, One last request. Bear witness. Tell everyone what you saw tonight. A short while later as Batman arrives, Tim scans the area stating that the radiation is a scooch higher than normal. Now one of the reasons you wanted Bane to have his way was to save Two-Face, but what was the second reason, Batman? Batman tells him, Bane had no reason to destroy the city's records, but someone did. And soon enough, that person will step into the light. It's another day in Gotham as the sun rises over the ruins of the once beautiful metropolis. The savaged lands heroes look over the traitors while they begin to set up shop, and the boy wonder has a burning question on his mind. What are they doing? Day in and day out, they work to try and keep the streets safe, but how does Gotham come back from this? They've had conversations dozens of times, but every time things are supposed to get better, and they don't. How much further down the evolutionary scale does the city have to slip before something changes? Heck, the Penguin actually seems like a respectable individual now. Batman asks if he's going to help or not, and Tim tells him that he's here, right? He's in this 100%. So Batman hands Tim a label of canned peaches, stating that there's a surplus of food expiring in the 90s. The cans have started appearing up in the North Grand and Front Street in the black markets. There's a cache that Penguin and the other scavengers haven't uncovered yet. Starvation is the weapon here. Food is the power. We don't want it in the hands of the profiteers. Meanwhile, at the unknown location of the cache, the black market sellers return to their stockpile when they notice that some of the boxes have been chewed on by rats. One of the men sees a rat skittering away and yells that they need to catch it. Let one live and they'll be breeding and you'll never get rid of them. One of the men spots the rat on a stack of crates, but as they get ready to throw something, more rats begin to appear. Suddenly, a wave of rats fall down on the men, and their screams echo out as they're being eaten alive. And that's when there's a glint of the rat catcher's canister, watching over it all. Later that night, members of the Phantoms gang rally up to sell some of their goods when an unexpected guest shows up in their bus storage unit. Tim steps out with one of the expired fruit cans, stating that it's nice to see the free market economy is alive and kicking. The leader of the gang tells the thugs to get him, but as Tim throws the cans and knocks the large man out, he says that he just has a question. Where are they picking up the surplus of canned goods? The leader asks him, who wants to know? And Tim says, oh, I want to know. And Batman wants to know? Give me the right answers and our curiosity will end here. The Phantoms state that they have a bunch of sewer rats who are selling the stuff, and those guys hang around Coslet Street near New Riverside. After prying open a manhole cover, Tim climbs down to face his next problem, which endless path to choose from. Tim runs the possibilities and then he hears a voice, someone shouting. He quietly follows the direction where the voice is coming from and that's when he begins to understand the words. The rat catcher calls out to his rats, stating that they have always outnumbered their enemies. Their strength was always in their numbers and now they've never been stronger. With the supply of food that they have, they'll be able to breed with confidence, and then they will take the streets, and Gotham will be theirs to the taking. Tim is listening and telling himself that the rat catcher has really lost it. Too much time in the fumes. But he's really working the room. As the rats claw their way into the cans, Tim continues his watch when a stray rat scurries towards him. Before Tim realizes, the rat jumps up and bites him in the heel, causing him to fall off the pipes along the ceiling. He catches himself, quickly yelling for the rat to go away, but the rat bites his finger and sends him crashing into the boxes below. As the rats surround him, the rat catcher looks over, stating, Well, this is a pleasant surprise. Seconds on fresh meat. Tim quickly leaps to his feet, telling the rat catcher to call them off, but the rat catcher shouts that there is nothing that's going to stand in the way of his army. Not him, and not any other masked do-gooder. <laughs> Tim dashes behind a tower of stacked boxes, throwing his weight into them, knocking it over into the rats. But even as they scatter out of the way, they make their way towards him, pinning him to the ground. He struggles to get them off, and that's when he sees that there is no other choice, bringing out his secret weapon. 
Seconds later, there's a loud zap as hundreds of thousands of volts pulse off of his costume. He begins to make his escape after stunning the rats, and the rat catcher yells that he will not get away. After him! With no other choice, Tim jumps down into the sewage below, stopping the rats in their tracks. And the rat catcher is forced to watch Tim Drake float away, shouting that he can't allow him to bring the others. They'll take our food! So the rat catcher does the only thing that he can do when he sends his trusty rat, Patch, to track down Tim. After tumbling through the pipe system for a while, Tim manages to grab onto a broken piece of metal climbing up onto a ledge. With hardly any energy left, Tim hurries to the abandoned subway station connecting the sewers to the rest, and he begins to take some antibiotics to avoid the infection. A short while later, after closing his eyes, Tim feels something cold touch his face. He springs up to see a bunch of people crowded around him and a young man wearing a wolf pelt, stating that they mean him no harm. They found him with an extremely high fever. The girl next to him says that they lowered his temperature with the ice. And Tim asks, Ice? Where in Gotham did you find ice? The boy who seems to be the leader takes off his wolf pelt, telling him that he can explain all of it. His name is Aragoth, the war chief of the Wolflings, and they are the guardians of Gotham's depths. Tim looks at Aragoth, thinking that that can't be his real name because his real name is Corey Windmere. He was in Tim's third period class in Gotham Heights High. Tim gets up stating that he appreciates the help, but they all need to remain hidden. There are some pretty mean characters fighting for control up on the streets. The girl tending to Tim asks, will he help them? And Tim says that they don't know anything about him, but Aragoth tells him that they know exactly who he is. Tim steps back asking, you do? And Aragoth smiles stating, of course. You're the squire of Batman, Robin the Boy Warrior. You fight for justice just as we do. However, you must rest. We don't have any medicine. Tim takes out another antibiotic pill, stating that he just needs to rest and take these. Give him some time to recover. There's a huge storeroom of medicines and food hidden here, though. Batman had sent him to find it. Aragoth calls out to the other wolflings, asking, Did you hear? The rumors are true. There's a quest for the wolflings. Tim tries to tell him not to go, but the girl tending to him says that he must rest. He ignores her request to catch up with the others, and Aragoth looks at him, stating that he is ill. Please allow the chief of the wolflings to fulfill the Batman's will. Tim tells him again that they can't. There are some really bad guys out in the sewers. Aragoth shrugs off the comment, stating that Robin's danger is the wolflings' danger, and they will complete their quest. Meanwhile, in another part of the sewers, the rat catcher walks through the sewage where Patch suggested that he go and stumbles upon some floating ice. He asks where it came from when suddenly he realizes the question is not where did it come from, but who. The rat catcher takes off his mask telling Mr. Freeze that it's been a while. Last time they saw each other, it was Blackgate. And Freeze says, ah, the rat man. Maybe you know where the supposed hidden stockpile of goods are located. It is said that it is in some kind of warehouse. Ratcatcher thinks for a moment and says that he's not so sure. He's been down here since Blackgate and hasn't come across anything like that. Wish he could help. Freeze fires his cryo gun, freezing one of the rats, shouting, You're lying! He then smashes the rat into a hundred pieces, telling the rat catcher that he will help him find the cash or he will end up like his little friend there. Ratcatcher says, All right, all right, you win. But back with the Wolflings, Aragoth leads his pack through the sewer system when Windrider crawls out of the vent stating that he's found it. A room full of a whole bunch of stuff. The Wolflings all quickly pile into the vent and they crawl through to the other side to find Ratcatcher's stash. Just as they begin to pick out things and bring them back one at a time, one of the Wolflings spots a rat. A voice then asks, Who are these kids? And the Ratcatcher asks, How should I know? The sewers are crawling with freeloaders these days. Aragoth stands tall, stating that the bounty is claimed by the wolflings. It is pointless to challenge us. You are two while we are many. And Ratcatcher asks, many, huh? Looks like all your friends are already in the middle of running away. Back a little ways, Tim is pushing through his fever, looking for where Aragoth went, when suddenly Windrider and another of the wolflings run past him. He tries to ask where is Aragoth, and the two just yell, Don't know, scary guys! Tim sees one of the wolflings drop his bow and arrow and decides that maybe he should bring that along. Back in the storeroom, Mr. Freeze fires his cryo gun again, hitting some of the canned food crates, attempting to shoot Aragoth and Ratcatcher, asking, Are you crazy? Turn that thing off! You're freezing this stuff, and if you do, it's no good to anyone. But meanwhile, up in the vents, Tim quietly creeps in, pulling back on the bow. He releases the string, and the shoddy wooden arrow pierces Freeze's tubes on his back, 
He spins around, freezing the pipes, telling Ratcatcher that he said nothing about Batman knowing of this place, and Ratcatcher says, You didn't ask! Besides, I've only seen the kid! But as Tim tries to get back into the vents, the part that was frozen shatters, and he lands on the ground. He knocks three arrows at once, releasing them, and they all bounce off of Freeze's armor. And he asks, Was that supposed to do anything? Aragoth puts his weight into some of the boxes, tipping them over onto the rat catcher. Freeze scoffs, stating, I don't need the rat man. Why make this difficult? It will only end poorly. So Tim hides behind a box, telling him, I need a plan. I can't attack head on. What if I were to... So he jumps up, throwing his batterings at the pipes that Freeze is standing next to. He breaks them so that all the hot water begins to pour down on Mr. Freeze, and as the steam is clearing, Tim jumps on top of a frozen-in-place Freeze, telling him, It's over! Try and move and you're gonna crack your cryo suit. A short while later, Gordon's Blue Boys take Freeze and Ratcatcher in. Batman watches, stating that he thought that they might have some bad customers down there. Had no idea that they were this formidable. Robin here did the impossible. It's time for us to go home. As Batman looks back, he sees Tim still feeling the effects of the fever. So he picks him up, telling Cassandra to stay with the cops until everyone is locked down. I'll be back when Robert is stabilized. As the moon hangs over Dr. Leslie Tompkins' clinic, a shadow is looming over some looters stealing supplies. Azrael tells them that they don't want to do this, but one of the looters says that they've got to. So Azrael steps forward, stating that the people in this hospital depend on the things that they're taking more than they do. They're sick and they're dying. The looters tell him, tough luck. They gotta survive too, not get out of the way. So Azrael puts on his mask, telling them, no. As the men charge at him, Azrael asks himself, who were these men before they found themselves in this cruel place? Criminals, muggers, perhaps thieves, or even murderers? Or were they just ordinary citizens, lawyers, grocers? plumbers, clergymen, husbands, brothers, loving fathers, or good friends, perhaps. Maybe all of the above. But what are they now? What have they been forced to become? A twisted combination of desperation and hunger. Less than animals, because animals would never have illusions. They imagine themselves victimizers. But can they possibly realize the truth that they themselves are victims? As the last man falls, Azrael stands tall in another triumph. Another glorious triumph. Hooray. But with another victory under his belt, Azrael returns to Leslie Tompkins, telling her that he has failed yet again. She asks, what did he do? Did he beat the tar out of another person? And Azrael says that it was three someones and they were trying to steal blankets. He may have hurt one of them badly. They might come here asking for help. She tells him that she'll help them, of course. But how long has it been since he has even slept? He rubs his head, telling her three days. He's not really sure, maybe four. Why does this always happen? Why does he always resolve matters with his fists? Leslie puts her hand on his shoulder, telling him that perhaps it's because that's all he knows. He will have to learn another way to relate to these problems, though. And maybe, for the good of his own soul, he may want to go someplace where there isn't such a demand for his peculiar talents. His salvation may even depend on it. Azrael asks, wouldn't she need him to protect the clinic? And she tells him that he should know the answer to that, but for now, he must rest at least an hour or two. He must be kind to himself before he can truly be kind to the others. So a short while later, Azrael finds himself wandering the streets looking for an answer. Should he stay or should he go? And that's when a shadow darts by in the distance. He runs tackling the person to the ground and when he looks at the person, he realizes who it is. The young woman, Mitzi, that he helped in the past. And he asks her, what was that for? He quickly helps her up, stating that he thought that she was someone trying to take something from the hospital. Why is she running? She explains that she was running because she thought she saw her uncle Jerry. Her uncle did some bad things, but, well, he isn't alive anymore. And not that she believes in ghosts or anything, but tonight, something's, well, it's different now. Azrael asks where her mother is, and Bitsy points off telling him that that is why she was out. Her mother wandered off to the Gotham City Gas Company. Azrael knows his body is quickly fading and that he should get some sleep, but you know what? Another few moments won't matter, will it? He walks towards the dilapidated building with a scavenger stating that he really shouldn't go any further inside. It's dangerous in there. He asks if the scavenger saw a woman pass by, and the scavenger says that he did, ran right into the gas works. So Azrael turns to leave, but the scavenger stops him, stating that he can't go in. He'll get himself blown to bits. There's pockets of gas trapped in underground pipes, and every so often, one of them blows up. Azrael asks why he didn't stop the woman from entering, and the scavenger tells him because she had a look in her eyes, like a demon was chasing her. He kept calling him Jerry, and he ain't about to mess with someone who's out of their mind. Despite the scavenger's warnings, Azrael decides to proceed. 
and he calls out to Mrs. Ferdang, asking if she's there, but he also gets no answer. So he continues in when there's a pop and an explosion that goes off. Inside that fire, a large figure appears telling Azriel that the time has turned on its axis and the barriers have fallen. Heaven has kissed hell and hell has kissed heaven and the both have come to embrace earth. He must open up his eyes and bear witness to the truth. Azriel asks him who he is and the figure says that he is the Saint Dumas, the founder of the order by which he bears his name. The order that has trained Azriel and his father and all of his male ancestors for six centuries in the arts of terror and assassination. There are so many souls that must be punished. Bis, Brother Rolo, and even the harlot Lily. And let us not forget the Batman, Azriel. There is a lot to be angry about and a lot of people to deal with. Want to kill those that still live, slowly and painfully? Can't decide? Well, there's plenty of time for that later, but for now, we must leave this wretched island. Remember what the old woman said, for the good of your soul. In fact, just south of Dixon Docks is a little cove, shallow water, and there's a boat weighed down by concrete blocks. You could use that to leave. Azriel opens up his eyes, stating that there's one problem with that plan. This isn't real. I was starving and exhausted and in shock and hallucinating. Saint Dumas tells him, you can believe that if you want, but look for the boat. And by the way, the woman you are searching for is hiding along the east wall. As Saint Dumas fades away, Azriel picks himself up and he asks how long he was out for. Who knows, he must find Miss Verdang. To humor himself, he goes along the east wall and sure enough, she is there. So if Saint Dumas is real, perhaps the boat is too. He heads a bit south of the Dixon docks, jumping into the water. After a little bit of swimming, he sees it, a boat weighed down by concrete bricks. And once he removes them, the small rowboat floats to the top, with Azriel getting inside. He could walk away from no man's land. He could walk away from the terrors and the obligations. He could step back into the world, but something nags him, faintly at first, but ever more insistently. He looks back to the Dixon docks, calling out for Mitzi and her mother. He tells her that she said to have no problem getting across. Just try and steer a bit and let the current carry you guys away from here. She says that she hopes that they can meet again, but before they go on this boat, she has one last favor to ask. She wants to see the face of the man that is giving them freedom, that is sending them away from Gotham City. Please remove your mask. Mitzi kisses Azrael on the cheek and then helps her mother into the boat. And they row off into the night, free of this treacherous city. There's a large thunk as a small chest of jewels and money is set on the table, and a man says that he needs a way out. All of this is theirs if they can make it happen. Phantom gang leader Shank kicks his feet onto the table asking if that's everything. Well, that'll work. We got ourselves a deal. The man jumps up asking, really? Thank you, thank you! Shank waves his arm stating, yeah, yeah, yeah. Show this man the exit, guys. Shank's goons walk the man to the dark door. And the man asks if he's gonna need a flashlight or something. One of the goons opens up the door, kicking the man in, stating, You ain't gonna need one! Bon voyage! The man tumbles down the stairs, asking, Which way am I supposed to go? But as he gets up, he walks around, tripping over a pile of bones, and he hears a faint sound. He looks up to see a dozen cannibals surrounding him. And as he realizes what's about to happen, all he can say is, Oh, man. Back up in the vault, Shank's girlfriend, Delphine, asks if he got another sucker. Shank tells her, Yeah. This one paid large. He wanted to get out of Gotham and now he's out. All this money may be useless now, but once this whole thing blows over, we're gonna be rich. Later, the next person comes in and Shank inspects the diamond, stating that it's a nice size. He'll give an open jar of peanut butter for it. The old woman tells him that he's a bandit for doing this, and after that, another man walks up, stating that he's heard that someone could get a one-way ticket out of the city. Shank asks, who's asking? And the well-dressed man responds with, matches. Matches Malone. Matches throws a stack of money on the table asking if that'll be enough, but Shank notices the gun on Matches' hip and he says that he likes the piece. Delphine takes the gun and Matches tells him that it's 24 karat gold inlay and ivory handles. Shank takes the gun and says that this just bumped him up to first class and you won't be needing this on the other side. As the goons walk Matches down, he asks, why don't you leave this place? And the men say that Shank has long-term plans here. Once the door opens, Matches tells the men, I'll raise a cold one to you. And as the men tell him sure he will, they push him down the stairs. Matt just tumbles down like the other man before, but when he hears the shuffling in the distance, he stands up telling the cannibals, I can help you. I can get you out of here. The cannibals all lunge grabbing matches, but Matches manages to knock them all away and escape. 
Up ahead a bit, he turns back, throwing small canisters of smoke to hide himself, but the cannibals rush at him, knocking him over a ledge. As they all inch closer to the ledge, they all look down and Matches sheds his disguise, and Batman jumps out yelling, I can help you! The cannibals all scream, shouting, Monster! And they begin to run away. Meanwhile, outside, a loud clang, clang, clang can be heard echoing throughout the hideout. Delphine follows the sounds to the exit door, hearing a faint hissing sound. She watches it, and suddenly the handle melts and it falls to the ground. Shank appears from behind her, asking, What's got you all frightened? And she squeals, Him! Batman charges at Shank in the group, and as Shank takes out the decorative gun, he pulls the trigger. The gun pops, falling apart, and Batman tackles into the men, fighting off the ones that are left standing. The cannibals start to come out of the dark, and Batman tells them, You're free, just as I promised. No more killing. It's over now. And as Gordon and the Blue Boys arrest Shank, Shank yells, I was selling people their dreams! They wanted out! I showed them out! But for Delphine, she's left to fend for herself, trying to sell off the money and jewelry for a loaf of bread. As the military keeps watch over the bridge that once connected Gotham to the rest of the world, they suddenly feel a gust of wind and they see the blue and red blur zoom by. The red and blue blur is none other than Superman himself. But to blend in, Superman flies into a phone booth to replace his costume with some tattered clothes as to not raise questions. He walks the streets and notices a man trying to get crops to grow, and he sees that he's trying to grow okra. The man shouts to Superman to get away, but Superman tells him that he might need some scarification to get these to grow. He takes out a small knife, cutting the outer layer of the seed off, stating that this will help it grow and allow water to be easily absorbed. The man says that's fine and all, but there ain't no water to absorb. Cold snap's been holding off the rain. As Superman replants the seeds, the old man says that he can help them over there at the community garden, though. They have a small setup going at the police station. Superman tells the men, of course, he could leave now. After a short walk, Superman notices a woman sleeping on the steps of the police station, and he asks if she's okay. She grabs her shiv, telling Superman to get away, and if he tries anything, Batman will come and beat him to a pulp. Superman laughs. I'm sure Batman will. The woman then says that it's not safe for them to be here. This is blue boy territory. They need to go before they blow her cover. She works for the orc. Superman holds his hand up, telling her to be quiet. He can hear someone coming. It's at that moment that a group of police officers in raggy clothes come walking up, and the girl quietly says that they aren't the Blue Boys. One of the officers takes out his gun, stating that it's a little late for them to be wandering around, and Superman asks, what's the problem here? And the man says that it depends. If he'd call being stuck in a god and government forsaken urban hellhole with a spineless police commissioner in a bunch of creepy mental cases dressed in bat suits, then yeah, they got themselves a little problem. Fortunately for them, they found a solution. This is a mutiny. Independent Sentinel. Private sector militia. What about you, though? You look pretty fit. Do you know how to shoot a gun? Superman tells him that he's heard ammo's hard to come by. And the young girl yells that it is. But ex-officer Petit here was crazy enough to have a Mondo private stash sitting around before this place became no man's land. Petit holds up his gun to Superman's head, telling him, We have no use for old men or children. So if you're not with us, you're against us. What'll it be? The young girl throws herself into Petit, yelling that the stranger says, forget it. And Petit falls back, taking the safety of his gun and pulling the trigger. The gun goes off, but Superman quickly uses his heat vision to stop the bullet. Everyone tries to pile on to Superman, but that's when Batman appears, knocking everyone out. As the remaining of Petit's gang begins to run away, Batman tells the girl and the old man to hurry back home. And once the coast is clear, Batman motions to Cassandra that everything is secure. And Superman says that it would seem that he's not working alone. Batman asks Superman what he's doing here after their last encounter, and Superman asks if he could go to the community garden. There's something he'd like to see. But to answer his question, he got a tip that the techno-terrorist group Locus is still trying to make Gotham its private lab, possibly with an aerial germ assault by small remote drones. The two scan the skies, and as Superman locks onto something, Batman asks if there's anything up there. And at the same time, both men say excuse me so that they can go deal with something. And then they return to their original spots. Superman then says, look, he came to Gotham to check up on Locus, but also walk among the people to really try and understand what happened and what it will take to help. So as the two of them reach the garden, Superman looks at the crops, and Batman says that he appreciates the concern. But they have a good team in place here. Superman looks up, asking if there's anything that he needs other than rain, and Batman tells him that he has everything under control. Superman shakes his hand, telling him, okay, well then, if you don't need me, others might. Good luck with everything, Bruce. He walks out of the garden, changing into his costume, and he flies off. And Batman stares at the crops for a moment as it begins to rain.
As Killer Croc is fitted for his new suit, he shouts that he ain't going back to the sewers. They're moving up in the world. Killer Croc is here and it's time to take back what's mine. MINE! And we're going to expand my territory. Branch out east, south, and crush anyone that stands in my way. The tailor says that he's going to need an answer on these ties. And Croc points at one, stating, That one, and the Paisley. I got some suspenders that'll match. As the tailor leaves, Croc turns back shouting, You hear me? Crush him! Meanwhile, in one of Batman's safe houses on Grand Avenue, Alfred is checking Tim's blood pressure and tells him that he's still quite weak. Master Bruce and the young lady will do fine without him for the night. Tim gets back on his feet, telling him that he needs to go call his dad. But how is he supposed to explain that he can't come home yet? This is the part of the job that's the worst. Alfred says that he understands, but he knows that he can't risk it. And meanwhile, in the Drake household, Tim's father sits by the phone, waiting for that very call from his son. A short while later on the streets, a man with a noose around his neck asks if maybe they can discuss this. A croc tells him, you had your chance, and he lifts him into the air. He yells, this is my turf now. Everything and everyone is now property of Killer Croc. And there's plenty of rope for anyone who thinks different. Now everyone bring me all your food, fuel, guns, and gold. Croc rides on his car, pulled by the people of the suburbs, calling out to anyone to line up and deposit everything into his cart. If they want to hold out on anything, you're gonna get cut off. And now you can live by my word. You can live because I let you live. The little girl walks up holding her crocodile doll asking if he can take care of Crocky. And Croc takes the doll and everyone gasps at what's about to come as Croc bursts out laughing. He tosses the doll back to her telling her that she'll take care. And then up on one of the ruined buildings, Tim reports back that Croc is making a move on South Grant. Not sure what it's all about though. Alfred tells him to use caution. He shouldn't be out in his current condition. He'll contact the master and Nightwing can deal with this. Tim says that he has no intention of tangling with the Mr. Lizard there, but if he could, and just then two of Croc's men appear around the corner and they begin to open fire on Red Robin. Alfred yells over the comms asking, is that gunfire? Are you in danger, Master Timothy? Tim quickly throws his batarangs telling him that he'll tell him about it later. And then he gets to work knocking the men out. And once it's all done, he reports back that the problem is solved. Alfred says that he highly suggests a hasty retreat. The area is dangerous, and as Tim gets back into position to scout the area, a third man steps out of the shadows, hitting Tim in the back of the head with a large wooden board. And a short while later, back over at the Blue Boy's borders, the boy catches his breath stating that he has a message for Gordon from the Penguin. Killer Croc is on the move. He's coming down from Grand towards Penguin's turf, and Penguin said that if he falls, the Blue Boys are next. He wants guns sent his way. After rallying up some of the armed officers, Harvey Bullock and Montoya head over to the Penguin outpost, and Penguin says that the adult amphibian is crossing Bidal Square heading their way. If Croc takes the district, he'll cut the island in half, and that is bad for business. Harvey tells him, yeah, 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 it's bad for everyone. Soon the dust is kicked up as Croc makes his way towards the barricade, and as they take a closer look, they notice someone tied to the hood of the car. Tim is struggling to free himself from the bindings as Croc shouts, It's all mine, Penguin! Stand in my way and I'll see you in the morgue. The morgue! But if you take any shots at me, you'll blast right through the boy hostage. Penguin readies his rifle, telling everyone that if they take out the crocodilian, they can take out the rest. Harvey points his gun at Penguin, telling him that he may want to rethink the strategy. They can take out Croc without harming the kid on the hood. Penguin scoffs, telling them that they're fools. Harvey and Montoya then take out small red grenades, stating that they won't be using deadly force. These puke grenades are going to make everyone wish they were dead. As the grenades are tossed, the hissing sound can be heard as brown gas fills the area. And Croc shouts, asking, is that all you got? I eat this stuff for breakfast. It's going to take a bit more than an upset Tommy to stop me. The car crashes into the barricade. But as Croc jumps into the fight, a man in a gas mask slowly creeps up on Tim. Tim asks if that's, and Alfred tells him to be quiet. The rescue must be serpentipitous if it's going to be effective. Croc claws his way to the front, making his way towards the penguin, but when he gets in range, penguin fires his rifle into Croc's chest. The buckshot rips through Croc's shirt, and he shouts that that was Egyptian kind, you bird brain son of a! This is my turf, penguin. Where do you want to be buried? Penguin laughs, telling him that better men have tried. Much better men, Croc. But before Croc can tear Penguin apart, Harvey fires his shotgun, tackling into Croc, telling him to stay down. 
After tying up Croc, Penguin tells everyone that that's it! We have them rooted. Croc rips apart the building, stating, You're giving me a headache. The suit was silk and wool. Now look at it! You're gonna pay with your blood. But just then, three batterings hit Croc in the arm, and Tim launches himself, kicking Croc in the head, telling him that he has to work on his pattern. Tim then cracks him with his staff, jumping onto the nearby car to get away. Croc reaches in, but Tim takes off his utility belt, tying Croc's wrist to the steering wheel before jumping out. Croc lifts the entire car, shouting, I'll kill you! But as the car is held up, the axle falls off, landing on Croc's feet. With him subdued, Harvey asks Tim if he's got a place to stay. And Tim says that Batman has a few hangouts left. As Tim runs off to meet with Alfred, Montoya and Harvey state that he is every bit as tough as when he was young. And Harvey asks when he was that kid's age? No way. With everything settling down, Tim tells himself that he would much rather face Croc again than what he's about to do next. But this has to be done. Tim sits down and he calls his father. He tells him that he's in Gotham, with his father shouting, asking if he's crazy and how the hell did he even manage that stunt? Tim says that there's an old service tunnel and some kids dared him and well, the path out is now blocked, but he's safe. After hanging up the phone, Alfred says that he doesn't envy him, but at the risk of sounding patronizing, perhaps things will look better in the morning. Tim jumps in bed to sleep for the night, but the next morning he's woken up by Batman. Tim hardly has enough time to rub his eyes asking what's going on, and Batman tells him that they have a problem. Tim gets out of bed, getting dressed, asking what's going on? Is it Two-Face? Is it Penguin? And Batman says it's not that kind of problem. Look at the TV, Tim. Every news channel is displayed, and each of them has Tim's father telling the world that his son is trapped in Gotham. Tim's eyes go wide as he realizes what's happening. Oh my god. All around her, Dr. Leslie Tompkins could hear the cries of her patients. Somebody's baby needs help. Somebody is dying. People need food. And as she begins to open up her medical bag, all she can see is, well, nothing. She promised to help them out, but how can she help them with no supplies? As she tries to come up with a solution, the cries for help soon become cries that a monster is coming. A shadowy man parts the crowd as he walks by, telling Leslie, that she isn't safe here anymore. Leslie tries to tell the man to leave her alone, but before she could finish her sentence, she wakes up. It was another nightmare, one that has been reoccurring night after night. And as Leslie walks out of her trailer, she sees that everything is like it was in her dream. People crying, they're begging for help. The only difference is that the monster in her dreams was further away. Laying on a beach, badly wounded and tied down, is that monster, Victor Zaz. Zaz is a pure sociopath, cuts a new mark into his skin every time he murders someone. His body is completely covered in them now. Helping Leslie watch over Zaz is the reformed black mask thug, Mikey, who himself has his fair share of cuts. But soon a scream can be heard and Leslie rushes over to the other wounded man named Stumpy, named after, well, his missing right hand. These people need blood, but there's a major shortage. So Leslie steps away to try and clear her mind. However, no sooner does she step away to the neutral zone than she hears something skittering in the shadows. She yells to the person to stop sneaking around and just come out already. Killer Croc, also not her monster, appears asking how is Stumpy doing? And she tells him not good. Croc shouts in anger, telling her that she has to do something. Stumpy's my only friend left here. He always makes me laugh so hard. Leslie says that she is doing all that she can, but Zaz is an effective killer. Stumpy has lost a lot of blood. Croc lashes out yelling that he will kill him. He will take that butcher down if he's got to tear this stupid little hospital apart. Leslie puts her hand on Croc's chest, telling him that he'll do no such thing. She will not tolerate any violence in the clinic. Come again in the morning and check on him then. Until then, try to cool down. Croc sighs, telling her that he's sorry. He'll come back in the... But before he could finish his sentence, the sound of a gun going off can be heard, and the bullet lands next to Croc's feet. Ex-Officer Petit holds his smoking gun, telling Croc to step away from the doctor. Croc sinks back into the shadows without saying a word, and Petit says that it was a good thing that they showed up when they did. Hope the rescue earns them a little medical attention, and no need to thank them. Frankly, he would have shot that freak for less than, but Leslie stops him, telling him that she lost her best friend and his wife to gunfire. If he has any intention of stepping into her clinic, then he will damn well do it without the guns. As for Croc, he's been watching over things while one of his friends recover. Petit tells her that they're going to try this again. They're coming off another battle where they're fighting to take the streets back for people like, well, her. He will disarm the injured and she will take them into her little free zone. 
Meanwhile, he and whoever else will lay a trap for that scaly homicidal freak. They're gonna get one more wacko before the final showdown. As everyone is taken in, Huntress watches over when there's another scream coming out of somewhere in the clinic. Mikey yells for help as Zaz is digging his pinky into Mikey's wrist. Mikey manages to get away asking, how did Zaz do that? He's still asleep. He would have killed him. It wasn't that he has killed, it's that he lives to kill. Everybody here is at risk as long as Zaz is breathing. What is the matter with the civilian do-gooders? Social charity work does not mean anything if you grant monsters refuge. Leslie tells him that she's afraid that that's exactly what it means. Some people may find their purpose through vengeance, but some doctors are pacifists. Huntress then shouts asking, you're healing Zaz on the grounds of pacifism? So that would mean that you wouldn't raise a hand in self-defense? Leslie says that is exactly what she would do. And Hunter scoffs, telling her, right. It would be easy to think that when you have Gotham's Dark Knight watching you. As Huntress turns to leave, she sees Cassandra wearing her old Batgirl costume and she glares at her. Cassandra holds out her hand in an attempt to say hello, but Huntress pushes her to the side and continues to walk. Next, she sees Batman before her, and he asks if she's going to push him out of the way of her too. After a moment of debating if she could push Batman, Hunter steps aside and leaves. This is the monster that Leslie is afraid of, Batman. Leslie asks if he's being a little hard on Huntress, and Batgirl says that she knows why he is. She lost six innocents to Two-Face, partially due to her negligence. They have brought in some supplies, gas for the generators, and a few pints of O-negative. Batman pauses, looking at Mikey's bandaged wrist, stating, This, this is Zaz's work. He hurries over to the bench where Zaz is tied up, yelling at him, asking if she's out of her mind for keeping him here. And Leslie runs over to stop Batman from untying Zaz, telling him that he can't. Zaz is unconscious. He can't heal like that. He will need an infusion as it is. Batman stares back, asking, Is this what I went through hell for? To save that monster? You will not use that blood that I just brought in for Victor Zaz. Leslie stares at him, telling him, yes, she will. And if he doesn't like it, he'll have to physically stop her. If Zaz doesn't get that blood in the next couple of hours, he will die. They cannot allow their only hope to turn into a killer. But before Batman could respond, gunshots can be heard, and Leslie turns back, calling out to Petite. Batman tells Cassandra to follow, but Cassandra motions, asking who is Leslie. Batman tells her that she is not his mother, but she's been like one to him for most of his life. Outside of the tents, Huntress tries to pull Petite's gun, telling him that he does not want to shoot anyone here, and Petite pulls back, asking, What's so different about now? As he falls back, he bumps into Batman, and Batman tells him, Because I'm different. And then another voice yells that they've had enough. Everyone looks up to see Croc in one of the buildings, and he shouts that if no one is respecting the hospital zone, then neither will he! Leslie goes back to check on Zaz, and Batman follows telling her that she needs to leave for her own protection. Zaz is underdeviated in his bloodlust. She will have to give him a better response than the Hippocratic Oath. Leslie stands up shouting, How about her consideration for the world that they live in and her part in it? He isn't the only one with a belief system. Whereas she is grateful for what he does in watching over them, he is being childish and he is being stubborn. And more than that, she fears that she has taught him nothing. She fears that she may sink to his level instead of raising him to hers. A few moments pass in silence without saying a word. Batman turns to leave. Leslie calls out to him, but Batman continues on. Outside in the neutral zone, Cassandra runs up and Batman tells her to stay here. Protect the doctor with your life. Cassandra grabs onto his cape, spinning him around, shouting, What? What is it? And Cassandra motions to her face. Batman tells her that he doesn't know what she's trying to say and he turns away. She then uses her finger to trace some of the rain falling off her face, showing that she's crying. Back inside, Leslie begins a preparation for Zaz's infusion when suddenly his eyes open. He jumps to his feet, looking around, asking where is he. Leslie tells Mikey to run, but before he could move, Zaz hits Mikey, knocking him headfirst into a pile of boxes. He starts to move towards Leslie, and she tells him that he certainly has the power to do away with her, but she wants him to consider one thing. Ending her life would end the possibility of medical care to all other people, including himself. He claims that murder is the only way to give him feeling, then she challenges him to feel her. She puts her hand on Zaz's chest, and she goes on stating that she asks for one second of compassion, or at the very least, the loss of her compassion, her attention towards her. Outside the fighting between Rock, Petite, Huntress, and Cassandra comes to a standstill with everyone watching. Zaz looks down at Leslie and tells her, You are one brave soul. It's inspiring to see someone act out their true nature. But my nature is to kill, so perhaps you should say your prayers. She begins to lay down on the ground, stating that she will not resist him with violence. And as he looms over, he's suddenly swept away. Croc throws Zaz into one of the tents, stating, You made a big mistake with Stumpy. 
And Leslie yells for everyone to stop fighting. And it's at that moment that Batman jumps down with a large cement pipe, sliding it over Zaz. He picks him up to leave, but Leslie stops him and hugs him. Batman asks, what is it for? I didn't save you, Croc did. Leslie tells him that she just wanted him to know that she would have preferred to lose her life than be the cause of him committing violence. And she's just glad to see him. She's always glad to see him. Later, she continues watching over everyone when there's a shadow once again before her. Batman falls to his knees telling her that he's sorry for being so violent. Leslie lifts her head stating that there's no need to be sorry. She told him many times before that he must work towards peace in the city and she will keep working towards peace in his heart. Do they have a deal? Elsewhere with Zaz, Batman thinks back to the question and quietly says, deal. As Batman and Jim stand in Jim's garden, the two men look at each other without saying a word. Jim tries to come up with something to say, but he remains quiet. After the wind blows by, Batman looks at one of the rose bushes and says that he did a fine job with the garden. Jim points at one of the empty plots, telling him that they had an infestation late in the summer. Had to tear up most of the vegetable patch to save the crop. Got some nice carrots out of it. Tomatoes, too. The two go back to their silence, and after a short walk, Jim takes off his glasses to rub his face, telling him that it's been a long year. A long year in the no man's land. Batman goes to respond, but Jim cuts him off, asking, Are we friends? And Batman tells him, Yes, we're friends. Jim looks away, telling him, It's damn odd, then. I don't have very many friends. I don't trust very many people, but I trusted you. I'm grateful for the help, but it's not enough. When the no man's land was announced, Sarah and I tried to get out. We wanted to get away and find work somewhere else, abandon the sinking ship. But everything that I applied for, I got turned down. No one wanted a cop who needed an urban legend to do his policing for him. They all laughed at me, some to my back, some to my face. And then I started to wonder, maybe the Batman was laughing at me too. Batman looks back telling him, it's not true. And Jim snaps, you used me. It's been that way for 10 years. Batman tells him, Maybe it's the other way around. And Jim tells him, absolutely, because I thought we wanted the same thing. I thought we wanted our city, this city, to be safe. That we were in this together, Batman. But where the hell were you when we needed you? This is why I don't believe that we're friends. There's no respect. There's no trust. There's always been secrets that I never pressed, but maybe I should have. Instead of letting this become this, whatever this is. Batman tells him, we're partners. And Jim scoffs. Don't you blow smoke in me. Partners are equals. When was I ever treated like an equal with you? Partners, for example, tell each other their plans. They keep them informed. They sure as hell don't walk out in the middle of a damn sentence. Batman quietly stares for a moment. And then he says, I was never good at saying goodbye. There's no man or woman that I respect more than you, Jim Gordon. You're the best cop that there is. Actions speak louder than words, though. Batman begins to take off his mask, but before seeing Batman's face, Jim tells him, Put it back on. I need you. I need our partnership. We have to save Gotham. We're so close. So put the damn mask back on. If I wanted to know who you were, I would have discovered it 10 years ago. But that's not the point. Jim waits for a few moments and then turns around, seeing Batman back with his mask on. Jim lets out a sigh, telling him, I figured that this would happen. We should plan it out. Batman asks, Tomorrow at sunset? And Jim tells him, Yeah, we'll do it here. I'll be waiting. Jim watches Batman leave, and he tells him, Good night as well. But the alliance is being forged, Batman tells Azrael that he has a task for him. One that could be the most important thing that he'll ever do. Catwoman is returning to Gotham sometime tonight or tomorrow. She'll be carrying something. Something that will determine the future of Gotham City. Azrael asks, what does it have to do with him? And Batman says, she may be injured or on the run. She's going to need a guardian angel. Azrael thinks for a moment, asking, how will she be entering the city? The last open tunnel was blown shut. Not to mention all the military choppers overhead. Batman tells him, she'll most likely be parachuting in near the eastern border of Robinson Park. Azrael asks, how could he be so sure? And Batman tells him, because that's what I would do. 40 miles south on a military base, a pilot tells his partner Freddy to hurry up. They're supposed to be on station over Gotham in about 20 minutes. Catwoman sits down in the pilot's uniform, stating that she may not be Freddy. But she's going to take a guess that he's glad that he isn't here. The pilot begins to ask how did she get in here, and Catwoman finishes by asking, How do you get past electric fences and motion detectors as well as the company of marines patrolling the area? 
easily. If I could do that, I'd imagine what I could do if you didn't cooperate. So how about we be friends for this little adventure? It'll be less painful that way. Now can we get this tinker toy off the ground? Up, up, and away, bright eyes! So a short while later, Azrael gets into position for Catwoman's arrival, but up in the skies, a pilot screams, asking, What the hell was that for? Catwoman laughs, stating that he might want to consider that a down payment on what he'll owe her if he ever thinks about disobeying her again. She just looked at the compass. They aren't flying north, they're flying northeast towards New York. He probably planned to pretend that he was lost or trying to run out of fuel, an excuse to radio the authorities. So she'll say this once, don't be stupid and change the course flying towards Gotham. The chopper leans back on course, but as the two get closer to the ruined city, the pilot says, You know, I've been thinking. I could probably come up with something to explain how I was outsmarted, but I don't really want to admit that some woman in a Halloween costume got the best of me. However, I would be happy to explain a downed chopper, as long as they find your body in the wreckage. As the helicopter makes a nosedive towards the ground, Catwoman tells him that he's bluffing, but as the chopper begins to bump and clip nearby buildings, it goes spiraling off course into the ground. Catwoman props herself up and slowly limps away when suddenly a spotlight overhead shines down on her. Agent Stone, CO of the Hardlines, the private military group that Catwoman ran into before, calls out that if she wants to keep running, she can do it if it makes her feel better. Whether she fights back or not, he's coming back to her. Azrael jumps between the two of them, telling him, no, she won't. This will be your one chance to get back into the helicopter and leave. Stone looks at Azrael, telling him, Oh, you must be new. Didn't recognize the suit. Either way, you can either step aside or get hurt. The choice is yours. The two charge at each other, deflecting some attacks while taking others. After hitting into one another, they back off, and Stone says that he's pretty good. Azrael goes back to swinging, asking, Are we done yet? And Stone tells him that he was just starting to enjoy himself. So later at the meeting place, Catwoman shuffles in, and Batman tells her, you're injured. And Catwoman says, yeah, but nothing a platoon of doctors in a week in Aruba won't cure. She hands over the disc and Batman says, I don't know how to repay you. Maybe I can't, but you've earned a lot of points today. She smiles as she limps away, telling him that she'll see him around. And over at Dr. Leslie's clinic, Azrael returns beaten and battered and Leslie asks, what is it this time? Just never mind. get on the table so I can examine you, Azrael. He laughs, telling her in a moment. First, she needs to do him a little favor. He continues to walk in, dragging Agent Stone behind him, telling him, You're gonna have to look at this guy, too. For Nightwing, it's the same dream every night. Him and Babs, before her accident. They would soar through the city, but then he would always fall. She would ask if he knew where he was, and then he would see her in a wheelchair as Oracle. He would wake up in her bed, and the nightmare was over. He groans, stating that his hands are cold, and Babs tells him that he let himself get beat up on by every thug in Blackgate, and he moans like a little girl. She kisses his forehead, telling him that the fever is going down, but before he asks, that kiss was purely scientific. Nightwing leans up, stating that he appreciates this, everything that she's done. Babs tells him to just be grateful that he came to her and not the subterranean boys club. Alfred wouldn't let him lie around and watch cartoons all day. Now get back to sleep. She'll call when the soup's ready. After a short while, Nightwing gets up, stating that the food smells great. She's going to put rice or pasta with it? She puts on her oven mitt, telling him neither. She made bread. Just then, an alert pops up that there's activity in Zone 1. Nightwing asks if it's important, and she says no. That's just seismic activity, but someone's on the street up front. The two sit down to eat, and the alarm goes off again, this time in Zone 4. And Nightwing asks what about that one, and she says that it's the steam tunnel running under the building. Whether it's a two-legged or four-legged, it won't be a problem. A lot of non-lethal nasties down there. Nightwing then asks, when is she supposed to worry about these alarms? And she tells him when it hits Zone 12, then she's in trouble. How's the soup? He eats a stating that he could get used to it, and the two of them begin to talk, and they eat. But an angry look comes over Babs' face as she leaves, and Nightwing says that he didn't mean to. He says there's nothing, she just has to check on something. He follows asking what is it, she says there's nothing, he just needs to be a good boy and go back and get rest. And Nightwing asks, is it because of the chair? She turns back telling him that it's more than that. And he says that no, it's not, tell him. She owes him at least that much. Babs takes a deep breath, telling him that he's right. She does owe him that much. For a long time, she felt that she had coped with the loss of her legs, learned to get over it. But lately, she's been beating herself up over it. She couldn't just get over it. She misses walking, running, turning the bathtub faucet with her toes. She then realized that she's never not going to miss this. There's so many things that she can't do now because of it. So many things that she had to leave behind, including him. He kneels down, stating that it doesn't matter to him, what can he do? And she begins to cry, stating that she just needs time, that's all. And he tells her anything, he just misses her. She touches his face, 
and says that he's gross, he needs a shave. So a few moments later, she slowly lowers the razor and Nightwing asks if she's done this before and she tells him not to smile and don't make her laugh. It really wouldn't be pretty for him. When she finishes, she kisses his cheek, stating that everything seems fine. And as the two look into each other's eyes, they kiss. It's at this moment that the alarm goes off again, and this time it is Zone 12. Nightwing grabs his mask, asking where is Zone 12, and Babs tells him the roof. But there's another on street level. Just then, the door to the computer room is broken in, and a group of well-armed soldiers surround Nightwing and Babs. Nightwing says that they are better armed than the usual scavengers, and they're going to need all of it. Petit takes off his helmet, shouting that they're not some street scum, they are the law, and Nightwing tells him, You stepped way over the line this time. You better call for backup, and another voice tells him, He already did, lover, as Huntress jumps down, stating that she is all the backup that Petit is going to need. One of the men points his gun at Bab, stating that she needs to keep her hands where they can see them. She folds her arms, stating, Tyndall, Canseco, Wintergreen. And just then, a flash of light blinds everyone with Nightwing calling out that that was smart. She tackles one of the men over, stating that he mentioned having his lenses polarized. She hoped that he did. He tackles into Huntress, telling her that he sure did. Looks like Missy here didn't get the upgrade, though. Petit aimlessly starts shooting, shouting that this isn't over. And as Nightwing quickly grabs Babs, he covers her, with Huntress grabbing Petit by the neck, telling him that he's not going to get one of them killed with that cowboy stuff. Once the two of them get to the safe room, Babs begins to get to work contacting the outside world when she asks Nightwing how he's doing. He weakly tells her that it was nothing, him and Huntress, it was a big mistake, way over that now, Babs. She tells him, right, as if I couldn't tell by the way you clocked her. Her and Petit are poisoned together. I'm not sure what their game is, but I figure that they think I'm a bargaining chip with my dad. I don't think that they know the whole Oracle thing. Babs begin to set off the rest of the traps in the room and then tells Nightwing that they need to go. She radioed everyone. They just have to make it out. As the two get into the elevator, there's a loud explosion with everything beginning to shake. Babs asks what the hell are those maniacs doing? They're going to bring down the whole place. And Nightwing tells her that they're going to be okay. They are. But before he could finish, the lights go out. Nightwing cracks a glow stick, climbing out of the elevator, grabbing Babs, telling her that this isn't going to work. And Nightwing struggles, telling her that it has to. They just can't let Petit find them. Babs laughs, stating that it's always like this, huh? I really had a thing for you back then. And Nightwing tells her that it didn't have to end there. It didn't have to end for him. But as the two reconcile, the doors to the next floor open up and Huntress jumps in, stating that she doesn't have time to explain. Petit is losing his mind. She may be their only way out of this mess. Babs asks if they're really supposed to trust her. And Huntress says, do you really have a choice? She cuts the cable to the elevator, sending it all the way down, with Petit rushing and trying to shoot everyone. As the elevator crashes at the bottom, Babs tells everyone to hurry to the garage, it's just up ahead. As the three of them get to the door, some of Petit's men stop them, radioing that they've cornered them. One of the other men tells Huntress, Petit can forgive you! Everyone get your hands in the air! Babs smiles, stating, of course, Mallory, Ripkin, Peppermint. Just then the floor falls out beneath the men, and they all go tumbling into the sewers below. As the three continue onward, Nightwing says that he gets it. An English scholar, a baseball player, but what about the third? She tells him it's a flavor of gum. She needed something that she could never say by accident. Once the three of them get into the garage, Huntress grabs Nightwing kissing him, stating that she'll see him around. Nightwing stands dazed for a moment and finally tells her, you're dangerous. Babs tells him, right, in more ways than one, lover. As the sun rises over Gotham City, a man stands tall, telling the citizens that no man's land is an embarrassment, a betrayal on the fundamental precepts of this country. That is why LexCorp says enough is enough. We have committed ourselves to rebuilding Gotham City. As Lex Luthor speaks to the media live from inside the fallen city, onlookers from all over the world tune in. But there's no one watching more closely than Batman himself trying to understand Lex's reasoning. Batman tells Babs to watch over the media and report back on anything noteworthy. Azrael and Batgirl are handling the Joker, and Tim will head west to monitor Petit and Huntress's camp. Tim asks if there's really anything for him to do over there, and Batman says, You'll not reveal yourself, just watch and listen. And Babs asks, what is he going to do? Batman says that he'll be the one to welcome Luther to the neighborhood. So. Later at Petit's stronghold territory, Huntress looks over their sector, making sure that everything remains quiet. Petit's right-hand man, Foley, walks up onto the rooftop, stating that he thought he'd find her over here. Petit then asks everyone to meet downstairs and talk about the Luther thing. Huntress says that she'll go down when she's damn well ready. Foley looks around to make sure that no one is coming, then says that he thinks Petit is losing it. 
He's done a good job of keeping everyone safe, keeping them safe. But that thing with Two-Face, well, he wanted blood for no reason. Huntress tells him that Two-Face is a killer and Foley says, right, but he's already in custody. Huntress gives Foley a final hard look and then leaves. And across the way, Tim watches and listens. Later that night inside Lex camp, Lex is sleeping in his comfy bed while Mercy stays away to keep watch. She hears something in the shadow, but before she can even turn around, she's knocked out and releases her grip on her gun. Batman looms over, waking up Lex telling him, we need to talk. As Lex wakes up startled, he looks at Mercy and says, I hope whatever you did to her isn't permanent. Good help is so hard to find these days. Batman tells him, she'll live. So Lex gets up, putting on his robe, letting out a sigh of relief, telling him, well, that's good, isn't it? Now, what exactly is the point of this visit? Planning on looming ominously for the rest of the night? Batman leans forward, telling him, you know what this is about. This is not your city. And Lex tells him that he is only here on a humanitarian mission, unless he can prove otherwise. Batman smiles and Lex tells him, you're bluffing. If you had anything, you wouldn't be here to threaten me. Batman moves nose to nose with Lex, telling him, this is not a threat. This is a warning. You won't be able to stop me. Neither is the bodyguard who's quietly sneaking up. Lex nods to Mercy, stating that it's of no use. Batman was just leaving. As Batman disappears into the shadows, Lex looks at Mercy, telling her to get Bane. Now. The next day, the news of Lex's construction efforts begins to sway the public opinion, urging more and more people to demand that the no man's land law gets revoked. But there's something more about all of this. Why is Lex saving Gotham? While Babs watches the news, Batman tells her, I need a line to Lucius Fox. As they're connected, Batman laughs, telling Lucius, It's been a while. Yeah, I'm out here in Barbados with some women, uh, working on my tan, Lucius. Lucius tells him, right, right. Have you heard the news? And Batman tells him in his Bruce voice, Yeah, that's actually why I'm calling. Uh, met this man the other day. He said he goes from Gotham. As it turns out, he says that Luther wanted to buy his real estate holdings in Gotham. Lex is offering top dollar. We haven't been approached, have we, to sell land or anything? Lucius tells him, no, but this guy, did he have a name? And Batman tells him, uh, sure. It was, uh, Harding. Or Nick or Buck. I know it was definitely Harding. Lucius sits back in his chair telling him, they haven't sold anything, and frankly, he can't. Presumably, if and when the No Man's Land law is lifted, every title will be reinstated. Batman laughs, that sounds good. I'll keep in touch. As the days go on, more and more steel and wood are brought into the Ravaged Land, slowly rebuilding the city to its former glory. But while that's going on, Batman keeps an eye over his city, waiting for Lex to make a mistake. While the efforts of restoring peace are made, there is someone hell-bent on disturbing it. Mercy reports that around 3.30 last night, the Joker appeared, destroying all of their equipment. Lex shouts, that's every night of this week. He's out of control. He's costing us money. Take care of the problem, Mercy. Later that night, as the workers begin to make progress on a new site, someone is knocking out all of the guards one by one, leaving the engineers exposed. Harley Quinn calls out that, I would like everyone's attention. Ladies and gents, backed by popular demand, it's the Joker. Joker smacks Harley with a rubber chicken, stating, That will be enough. Anyways, good evening, folks. Glad you can make it. We have a great show in store for you tonight. But first, let's speak to the audience. What is your name, miss? A frightened worker says, l, -l, -l lori The Joker laughs, stating, You might want to see something about that stammer. Or I could take a closer look. He pulls out a pair of scissors from the rubber chicken, and the woman backs up, begging him not to. But just before the Joker could snip, he hears footsteps and yells, Finally! I was beginning to think that no one cared! As Joker looks back, he looks up, stating, Oh, well, this is going to suck. Bane grabs Joker by the collar, telling him, You aren't very funny. And he punches him across the site. The Joker slides underneath Mercy, telling him, I see Europe! I see France! However, before he could finish, Mercy cocks her gun, and the Joker just smiles. Bane lifts Joker back up, and Mercy says that she will be the last face that he ever sees. No one messes with Mr. Luther's business. Harley readies her shotgun, telling Mercy that no one messes with Mr. J, unless they want a new breezeway through their skull. Mercy grabs the shotgun, pushing Harley away, telling Bane to let Joker go. Joker and his crew begin running, and Bane asks, Should I kill him? And Mercy says, it won't be necessary, he got the message. The next day, the Penguin says that he isn't one to be kept waiting, and 
Lex tells him, make it fast. I would rather not be seen with you. Penguin twiddles his finger, stating, exactly. That is why we really shouldn't be telling the media about this meeting, right? Here's the deal. Once Gotham is rebuilt, everything will be fine and good. And as for its underworld, well, how about we share a little bit of that pie? As Penguin's men surround Lex and Mercy, Lex asks Mercy if she could. And within seconds, she takes out all of Penguin's men save for one. As Mercy holds him up, she asks, this one as well? And Lex stares into the Penguin's eyes, telling her, do it. And then her gun goes off. Lex says that he will never threaten him again. They can both see that he has mercy. While Lex gets back to dealing with his distractions, the world tunes into the news for a very important announcement. Lucius Fox announced that as of 10.30 this morning, Wayne Enterprises is proud to be a part of the coalition to help make this happen. Access to Gotham will be restored in the next week, and they will be delivering emergency supplies and equipment, as well as an army of engineers. The goal is to officially reopen Gotham City on January 1st, New Year's Day. Ladies and gentlemen, no man's land is over. Christmas is drawing close, so the people of Gotham begin to hope once again. Soon it may be over. Soon the no man's land may end. As military helicopters fly in with supplies, everyone across no man's land looks to the sky. Lex continues to bring in more and more building supplies. Medical equipment is brought in to treat those most affected by the devastation. But there's one lingering question. Where did the Joker go? One more bit of good news is that the Attorney General reopened the GCPD, allowing Jim to become the police commissioner once again. However, as good as things are moving forward, over in the strongman's territory, things are beginning to move backwards. Foley said that on Christmas Eve of all times, everyone should be allowed to go wherever they want. They just can't keep us in one spot. And Petit shouts, no, everyone here will attend. No more of our numbers whittling away. We will have a Christmas feast. Attendance is mandatory for the sector. If anyone has a problem with that, Petit pulls out his gun and Huntress yells that that's enough. He scoffs telling her that everyone will be there. But still, no one has seen hide nor green hair of the Joker. Batman asks Penguin, Poison Ivy, Ventriloquist, and Two-Face, and they all have the same answer. They don't know, and they don't give a damn. So with that, Christmas Eve comes, and everyone sits down for dinner together as a family. Even Petit and the strongman inside their own mess hall. As dinner gets underway, a guard radios in, stating that he's here! The Joker! He's coming in! Petit grabs a rifle, telling everyone that this is it on your feet. And Huntress asks, are you crazy? You can't send them out there. The Joker didn't just show up to the lion's den to be shot. It's a trap! The Joker stands outside, shouting, Merry Christmas, pigs! Come and get me! Back inside, Petit tells Huntress to get out of his way, and Huntress shouts, asking, Do you know what the Joker wants to do? He's trying to bait you! And Petit tells her, No, he's challenging control. He's making me look like a damn fool in front of my own people. No one does that. He finally pushes her out of the way as he takes a squad outside, and as he looks around, he finds nothing. As the snow begins to fall, Petit looks around for his target, when he finally finds Joker hiding inside of a building, and he pulls the trigger, shooting the Joker in the head. He stands back up asking, Was that really hard? And the Joker's voice calls out asking, Would you like to try for two? He steps out, and before he could fully step out, Petit fires again, and then a third Joker steps out and Petit fires again. Foley and Huntress run up to the Jokers, yelling that he is shooting his own men. The Joker is dressing his men up like him. More of Petit's men are sent out and all are gunned down, one after another. Huntress and Foley try to reason with Petit, but he either doesn't hear them or he's ignoring them. He calls out to the next squad to come out and Huntress tells Foley that she will remain here. But he needs to get to Central and get help. Sarah, Gordon, anyone. Foley says that he will come back as soon as he can. And as he gets up, Petit looks over and says, I told everyone that they cannot leave without permission. He takes out his sidearm, firing a single bullet, hitting Foley square in the forehead. Huntress's grief quickly turns to anger as she charges at him, shouting that he is just as mad as the Joker. Foley trusted him. He trusted him to protect everyone. They all did. Huntress punches him over and over, shouting, You are a dead man! And that's when... Balam. 
Teat looks up as he draws his last breath, and the Joker walks out with his crew, stating, I couldn't have said it better myself. Now, why don't you make like a good girl and move along? We're gonna get those babies and, well, we'll just have to wait for a surprise. Huntress stands in front of the door and the Joker asks, Do you really want this? You versus us, there's like 20 of us. And thanks to Petite here, we're armed to the teeth. Huntress readies herself and the Joker says, Suit yourself, get her boys. All of the henchmen charge in and the Huntress kicks the trash to the fire to slow them down, fighting off as many as they can. But as the Huntress thinks that she will be able to do this, another gunshot goes off and she feels a sharp pain in the side of her chest. Joker walks up. You're good, you're real good, but I've seen some of the best. Another shot goes off, hitting her in the stomach, and she slumps onto the door as the Joker goes on. You know, it's funny. I wouldn't normally be shooting you like this, except it turned out that Petite had so many bullets. Seriously, he had like a bullet for every man, woman, and child in Gotham. Huntress begins to stand up, but the Joker shoots her a third time in the leg, telling her, you really are a tough little thing. <laughs> Huntress looks up, as the Joker pulls the hammer back in the gun and tells him, bite me. But before the Joker could pull the trigger, a battering flies through the air, hitting the Joker in the wrist, and Batman grabs him by the shirt. Harley grabs one of the discarded guns, opening fire, but Batman turns to her, knocking her out. With Batman's attention diverted, the Joker takes out a small remote, telling him, Since we're all here, it's time to bring down the house! Nightwing hauls out the bomb overhead, and Batman quickly throws a battering to dislodge it from the building. Huntress weakly stating, Babies. He wanted to take the babies. Batman unscrews the small device left by the Joker to find that it was a decoy, and he tells Nightwing to bring her to Dr. Tompkins. Huntress looks up at Batman, asking, Are you happy now? He brushes her hair aside, telling her that she needs rest. You did good work. Nightwing lifts her up, telling her, you should feel special. That's like his highest praise. Over in the Gordon household, Jim, Babs, and Sarah all begin to open their gifts to each other when suddenly Batman appears. Jim asks, is something wrong? And Batman tells him, we have to discuss a serious problem. Joker attacked Petite's camp. Huntress held him off, but she's in critical condition. She said that the Joker was after infants. It's been confirmed. He kidnapped all of the babies across no man's land. This was his statement. He wants to murder Hope. As every able person gathers together, Batman explains that Oracle has confirmed that LexCorp is missing 70 pounds of Semtex. What's more, he kidnapped 36 infants. They will find them, but at that moment, the laughter can be heard and the Joker yells on the rooftop. I don't think so. Here's how it's going to play out, Batman. Was the night before Christmas, and all through the town, little babies were hidden by Gotham's evil clown. As the Christmas day neared and the sun it did rise, either bats found the kids, or the kids, well, they dies. Batman shouts, go, to everyone as he gives chase, quickly grappling his way to the rooftop. And as he gets to the top, he doesn't see the Joker. He scans the area and he notices the Joker down below waving his arms and he jumps down to follow. And as the Joker looks back, Batman grabs him, telling him, I thought so. The Joker tries to attack, but Batman deflects it, slamming his palm into the Joker's face, telling him, That is enough, Quinn! He rips off the Joker costume, asking, Where is he? As his grip tightens on Harley's throat, she manages to tell him, Central, hit the babies. Police station! Please don't kill me. Batman throws her down, radioing to Babs the location of the babies, and she quickly sends out the message to everyone. As Jim is listening in, he says, that's where Sarah went. Sarah looks at her radio as the message ends and then begins to hear the faint cry of babies nearby. She grabs her gun. She slowly makes her way towards the sound when she hears someone stating, sure, it's okay. You won't feel a thing. Unky Joker's here. She kicks in the door, telling the Joker to freeze, and as he turns back, stares. He pulls at his gun, stating, I would like to report a crime! You tried to shoot me, and I dropped the baby! He tosses the baby to Sarah, and as she catches him, Joker points his gun, and he fires. As everyone converges on the station, the Joker walks out the front door, telling them all, I surrender!
And a few moments later, Renee and Bullock come out in tears, stating, they're so sorry. Jim turns to the Joker, punching him to the ground, shouting, you animal! And the Joker laughs as he wipes the blood from his mouth, telling him, you'll be hearing from my attorney about this! Jim pulls back the hammer on his revolver, telling Batman he has gone too far. Paralyzed my daughter, my little girl, and he just murdered my bride. He has gone too far. Batman tells him that they've all gone too far. Look at them. Look at us. We can't take any more. It's time to bring our people back, Jim. Jim continues to aim his gun at the Joker, and Batman turns, telling him, I won't stop you. Jim's hand begins to tremble, and the Joker asks, You have a son, right? The gun goes off, and the Joker screams in pain. Hey, you can't let him do that! He shot me in the knee! Oh, like your daughter! I get it! Good one, Kamish! Jim puts away his gun, telling them that they're going to arrest him. But before he could even walk down the stairs of the station, he collapses. Batman catches him, telling him, I've got you. As the priest starts his service, Babs can't hear a thing. She can hardly feel Nightwing's hand on her shoulder, and she can't stop crying. Everyone stops to give their condolences, even Lex Luthor. But as everyone leaves, Batman remains. Jim looks at him and asks one question. Was it worth it? It was December 31st, the last day of No Man's Land. And as the night approaches, Lucius meets with Batman to go over something that he found, well, disturbing. As Batman gets ready for the grand reopening of the city, Lucius asks if he remembers when they spoke of a man named Hardy. Batman plays dumb, stating no. Lucius goes on stating, well, he did. Said to look into him selling his land to Luther. Turns out, Harding doesn't exist. Whoever he spoke to was trying to give him a tip of some major fraud. Batman says that he doesn't really understand, and Lucius tells him that he will skip the boring stuff. All he needs to know is that it looks like Luther has been tampering with official records, and that's why he's been here all along. He wants to own Gotham. This is the proof. These are notarized copies of actual deeds as well as Luther's forgeries. We're going to go to Luther directly to see what he has to say about this. And Batman asks, should I go with? And Lucius says that it won't be necessary. Kick back and enjoy the party. As Lucius leaves, Batman begins to take off his suit telling Alfred that Luther is going to listen to what Lucius has to say and then kill him outright. Alfred reaches for the closet and pulls out the cowl, handing it to Batman. With New Year's Eve coming, Gothamites and News all gather at the newly reopened Gotham Tower built by Lex. As Jim and Babs arrive, Jim says that he was never good at these public things. Sarah was always better. He's so lost without her. Babs takes her father's hand, telling him that she knows. She knows. Meanwhile, upstairs in Lex's office, Lex straightens his suit, telling Lucius to make it fast. Lucius tells him, of course, he wanted to stop by and drop off these documents. While reviewing the records, there seems to be some, well, discrepancies. Lex begins to read through them, stating that this is clearly irregular. Hopefully, no one is implying fraud. Lucius tells him, certainly not. It's obviously an attempt to slander him by implying this. If these were to be leaked to the media, though, Lex sits back in his chair and says that they should keep this quiet. No need to involve the press, he'll have his people look into it, and in the meantime, would it be an issue leaving the documents here? Lucius tells him, of course, he's got copies. Glad that they'll be able to sort this out. As Lucius leaves, Lex throws the papers off his desk, telling Mercy to kill that man before he gets downstairs. She runs after him, and the second she reaches the door, Batman kicks it in, knocking her to the ground. She jumps to her feet and begins to attack, but Batman blocks all of her hits, telling her, You're good. Just not good enough. He knocks Mercy to the ground, jumping onto the desk, telling Lex, I warned you a month ago. This city belongs to Batman. Gotham is not for sale, and if you leave now, you can be in Metropolis by midnight. And with that, the New Year rolls in, and the people of Gotham find peace. Jim pours two glasses of champagne for Sarah, telling her that he loves her. And Happy New Year. And across the way, Batman places two roses on his parents' grave, looking up at the fireworks as they light up the night sky. And there you have it, the Batman No Man's Land storyline right here at Comic Story. And now if you enjoyed this, make sure you like, subscribe, and check back every Monday for a massive compilation of all of our older videos. Thank you guys, and I'll see you next time right here.